Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming to the Committee of the Whole tonight. Um, just uh, sending regrets from Councillor Trace and Councillor Logan as they can't be here tonight. And um, we would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the shared traditional lands of the Coast Salish people before we begin. So with that, I'll have uh, approval of the agenda. So moved. Second? Second. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Moved. Second, uh, we have one set of minutes to adopt today. Um, 2.1, Committee of the Whole from February 19th, 2018. Secondary. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Okay, that leads us to public participation. Um, just to clarify, uh, the public will have a chance to speak after every item. Um, you are allowed to speak now, and then you will have um, another chance at the end. And just a reminder, well, there's no one else, and Chris knows the drill. Uh, so public <laughs> participation. Give it a moment. There we go. Good evening, Honorable Chairperson. I'm Chris Wright. I reside on Marianne Crescent. Uh, I'd also like to uh, say to anybody who's watching this online that it'd be really nice to see more members of the public out here. I think I'm the only person present. Um, I support the level of detail uh, found in this year's budget, and although I'm looking for further information this evening, I don't think it necessarily belongs in the budget document directly. I appreciate that, that it is tough to balance the need for including relevant information with the need to make the budget readable by the public. My comments relate to the funding of services provided to the city under contract by the RCMP. As the focus of this year's budget is service-based, I will be referring to the RCMP as the service provider in my comments. According to BC Stats, the population of Colwood was 17,126 in 2015 and 17,952 in December of 2017, which is a 4.8% increase over three years. If this committee were to accept the service provider's request for additional support staff this year, it would result in an increase of 16.7% of city-funded non-uniform service providers. Any time the size of an area of government increases at a rate faster than that of the general population, I am inclined to want to know why, as this is not a sustainable strategy for very long. My experience in years past in other cities has been that big government is a bad idea. From last night's presentation to council by the service provider, I learned that despite the increase in our population, crime in Colwood has declined by 2%. From page 33 of this year's draft budget, the third line of values in the table at the top of the page indicates that the service provider underspent their budget allotment in 2017 by $672,000, which is an underachievement of 24%. This means that the level of service that Colwood taxpayers expected was not delivered. Said another way, this means that Colwood taxpayers paid 32% too much tax towards the level of service that was actually rendered by the service provider. Prior to the meeting of this committee, during which policing was covered, I asked the service provider's representative how effective last year's additional watch clerk position had been in reducing overtime costs and received a one-word response, good. Now I see that this year, the service provider is requesting more non-uniform support staff. In looking through the explanation for this, which is also on page 33 of the proposed budget as new operating budget items, I see some general statements and a list of acronyms for computer systems. This is not a business case that is convincing to me. In fact, it is not a business case at all. It is just a list of acronyms. I endeavor to follow council meetings closely and do not recall council expressing any concerns about the level of service to Colwood for exhibits or court liaising being lacking in some way. I am not aware of any such concerns being made in the general media or by special interest groups. I find it backwards that our city 
which let the contract for policing services is passing along the service provider's cost increase rather than the city defining the level of service that citizens expect to receive and providing funds to achieve that goal. Committee members, if I were in your seat, I would be asking the service provider to furnish the city with a solid business analysis that demonstrates the need for funding a new position and the consequences to the citizens of Colwood if that position is not funded. I would expect that would provide committee members with a beginning point from which to have a discussion about police service levels. Until that happens, I am opposed to seeing my taxes increase yet again for another unrationalized, non-uniformed support staff position. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, seeing as there is no one else and there's new old business, uh, we'll carry on to new business. First item is 5.1, presentation on the budget process overview, and I'll hand that over to the Director of Finance. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I will begin today uh, by running through uh, the overview uh, uh, presentation that we've become accustomed to the last couple budget meetings. Um, a lot of the information um, we've been through uh, a couple times, so I'll, I'll skip through a lot of that and recognizing that uh, uh, we have no new members in the, in the public gallery, um, we can probably afford to go through some of that information in a bit quicker. Uh, today you'll see w um, we've assembled a team of of, uh, uh, of a staff um, to provide some input on the capital budget. Um, Deputy Director Hepting and myself are going to go through um, the bulk of the capital budget as well as the, the remaining operating budget item um, together and, uh, and, uh, and uh, provide comments on the high level and uh, Council, of course, will have an opportunity as well as the public to ask questions as we go along. Um, so today we will have uh, one presentation related to the operating budget, and that's the engineering uh, operating budget. And so uh, Director Hoglund is with us uh, here today as well. And then we'll move into asset management and uh, the capital budgets. The capital budgets, and I'll comment a bit more about this when we get there, is structured a little bit differently than you probably are, are used to. Uh, typically, capital budgets are presented on a departmental basis, um, which is uh, which is common. Um, however, this year, to um, emphasize the focus on a asset management, we've uh, presented it on an asset type um, basis, uh, recognizing that asset management is a core responsibility of the whole organization. So we'll go through the capital plan in, the, in that uh, manner, and there may be a uh, asset uh, capital budget that uh, you'll see input from uh, numerous uh, directors. So turning your attention to the presentation before you, uh, this is the um, uh, schedule that we're adhering to so far. We're in a, we're in a third meeting, February 27th, uh, which w uh, was moved from the February 20th uh, original date, and today we'll be going through capital asset and the engineering operating. Uh, we have another meeting scheduled for six days from now, March 5th, the Monday, and uh, uh, assuming things go well today, um, we'll have uh, a wrap-up meeting, uh, go over how everything comes together in, in the uh, budget, and I'll be asking for um, uh, notional approval from the committee on that date um, so that we can move forward with some of the budget items. Now, most of the budget items that are before you, such as operating items or uh, special projects or capital budgets that are carry forward, um, staff already have the authority to, con uh, to continue with those uh, projects and spending um, pursuant to last year's uh, financial plan bylaw. However, the new items, um, s uh, staff don't yet have the authority, neither do they have the, um, the nod from council to proceed. Um, so the March 5th meeting will be important if uh, council is comfortable in providing notional approval at the committee level. There are a, s a number of uh, projects that are waiting for that approval before moving forward. So I'd ask uh, Council to consider carefully um, uh, at that March 5th meeting um, because it will be a signal to staff to begin some projects that weren't in last year's uh, uh, five-year uh, financial plan. 
So uh, I'm skipping through most of this stuff because I've been through it the, the last couple of meetings, but one thing I will note is that the reduced MSP premiums was short-lived. Uh, probably aware that the federal, uh, pardon me, the provincial budget has recently been tabled and the MSP premiums are going to be replaced with the health tax on employers, which uh, Colwood would be uh, subject to. Uh, this year, half of the MSP premiums were phased out, um, but I'm projecting so far, because the details aren't um, completely uh, available, but I'm projecting when the health tax come into comes into place, the city will be paying more in the health tax than it was in the MSP premium, so we'll be going back up uh, starting uh, next year. Uh, much of this information remains the same. Um, actually, it all does remain the same. The core recommended increase of 1.3% new construction. We're still awaiting uh, the revised rule, which come out in early, which will come out in early March, and that will finalize new construction revenue totals at that time. Now, that information most likely will not be available for the March 5th meeting. So, should no market change revenues. Um, change, uh, we'll have to adjust the budget accordingly. So I'll bring a, a couple different options to council, uh, to the committee at, at the March 5th meeting um, with the assumption that that uh, new construction revenue amount will change. I don't expect a significant uh, change, but certainly it does change between the completed role and the uh, revised assessment role. And uh, I'm just skipping through the dra draft budget summary again because nothing has changed with regards to that since the last presentation. A number of capital items have been added to the version 3 uh, that you have before you now and which is available on the website. Uh, first of all, Public Works Equipment 24 has been included in the schedule. So that was a supplementary uh, request that was uh, put in by Public Works and Finance simply missed it, so it, it's in there. And it was in previous year's capital budget, so it, uh, it's not a surprise. And it's also uh, well-funded, which we'll talk about later. Uh, same same goes with uh, parks vehicle number 52. Um, there's an additional uh, special project that's been added between the um, version 2 and version 3, and that's the confined space consulting special project. And Deputy Director Hepting will go over that uh, project in the engineering um, operating uh, budget presentation, and then uh, there's also been a space planning special project added. This is this was to the um, this was um, uh, pertinent to the uh, corporate administration budget, which wasn't um, um, which wasn't discussed then. So I believe that project w uh, should be discussed in a bit more detail, uh, given the same uh, opportunity for scrutiny as we have with any of the other project projects through the um, um, through the budget process. Uh, but that can occur at the March 5th meeting. So that will conclude the, um, the overview presentation. Next, what we're going to do is uh, run you through the engineering operating uh, budget, and we'll discuss as well uh, some of the accomplishments and plans, as well as the, um, uh, the special projects related to engineering operating. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Did, the, did Chris, any questions? No. Committee, any questions or comments? Uh, seeing none, so we'll move on. Director of Engineer with the uh, core operating budget. Or sorry, Dr <laughs> Jen, please, thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I'm starting on page 42 of the financial plan document before you, just a quick overview of the engineering department. Um, so 2017 saw some changes. Council approved a financial plan that introduced a full-time manager of development and subdivision services, and this replaced um, a former position, the deputy director of engineering. Um, and so this effectively created a land development division for the city, and both this position and a permanent director of engineering and public works were filled in March of 2017. Um, so along with this change, moving over to have a look at the engineering department operating budget, um, we are now collecting um, administrative fee revenue with respect to our works and services agreement. So that is having um, a positive impact on our revenue budget and the actuals that we collected in, in 2017. Um, with respect to the operating expenses, the core operating expenses for the engineering department um, they came in on budget, and 
approximately 90% of, of these costs are relating to s related to staffing levels, and the remaining 10% of the budget is related to professional fees, so consulting fees, employee memberships and dues, that sort of thing. And um, again, the increase that we're proposing for 2018 is in line with inflation um, and the necessary uh, increases for, for labor costs. Moving over to review some of the accomplishments from 2017. Sorry, actually, before I do, I should comment on the 2017 operating budget just included funding for 75% of the new manager position. And so we are now seeing the effects of funding 100% of that position. Um, so we have expanded the core budget for 2018 um, and every year thereafter. Now moving over to the accomplishments to highlight for 2017, um, we did see some policy implementation. So the city implemented a new municipal street tree policy. Um, we also created a traffic calming policy that's been adopted by council. Um, a number of construction projects went to RFP and were completed. Um, we're well aware of the improvements between Hatley Drive and Lagoon Road on Machosen Road there, so city staff issued an RFP and we saw completion of a sidewalk, bike lanes, crosswalk and traffic calming measures. Um, also painted bike lanes on Machosen Road. Um, we saw the installation of a crosswalk pedestrian signal at Wishart Road and Machosen. Um, as well, an, a replacement of a number of aging fleet and um, we have begun work on some of our, our bylaw reviews and uh, rewrites, um, being the DCC and the subdivision servicing bylaws, which I'll get into in, in more detail. Um, with respect to plans for 18, perhaps I'll start with on page 44 and just review the special projects. Um, so a number of these projects are either in progress or they were approved under last year's financial plan for the 2018 year. Um, and so I will highlight that for each of them. So starting with the city's coastline erosion study, this is a multi-year project with three phases. This project is in progress. Um, it was started in 2017 and a contract has been awarded. And so phase one was underway and is continuing into this year. And phase two um, includes a risk analysis and protection plan for Ocean Boulevard from the pump station to Perimeter 2 Park. And then phase three will follow. Um, and phase three of will be um, somewhat dependent on the results from phase two of this study. And the, um, the budget, the $49,000 there, that is carry forward of the unspent um, budget that was approved in the 2017 financial plan. The uh, next special project is a new project, Confined Space Consulting. Um, so our occupational health and safety regulations um, do outline requirements to ensure the safety of our employees in confined spaces. Um, for example, our pump stations. And um, so we are doing some work there to create a confined space um, inventory. And uh, as well in our operating budget, we do have uh, funding for training for staff. Uh, moving over to the development cost charge bylaw review. Um, so this special project was approved under last year's financial plan and it has been deferred to 2018. Uh, we want to ensure that this, this review is in line with our revised official community plan um, and the anticipated growth of the city. And uh, the, the city will be working with a consultant on this initiative and um, the consultant has been secured for this project. The next project identified is a new project, um, and this is in line with some of the many initiatives we are undertaking with respect to asset management. Um, so the city will be looking to have a geospatial survey performed um, to provide some photos both of our boulevard trees and our ditches um, to start to populate our GIS software with, th with this inventory. Similarly, the next project identified the lagoon and pedestrian bridge inspections. Um, the lagoon bridge due for inspection this year. Um, and then the pedestrian bridge is again two years from now in 2020. 
and these inspections will inform repa repair efforts. Um, so again, in line with asset management works. Uh, Meadow Park electrical upgrades. Uh, this is a new line item identified for 2018 um, to provide electrical res <laughs> receptacles um, on 10 uh, park light standards within Meadow Park. Uh, the next project, um, again, new project in line with asset management initiatives. And this is a pavement condition assessment um, which will really help um, us identify the, ne the needed works on the city's um, paved road network. The, the next special project, Ocean Boulevard Park and Ride. Um, so this here is, um, we've been talking about this recently at, at Council, but it, there is funding required um, with the rezoning efforts to formalize this piece of um, from a highway dedication to a land asset, and uh, th that work is, is well underway. The next special project, the rock face monitoring, uh, monitoring this is a new um, item identified by staff. Um, so the city owns various rock bluffs um, that we do need to manage as part of our asset management program, um, and so this project is to ensure that a consultant is engaged to undertake risk assessments on um, the city's rock bluffs. Stormwater master plan. Um, this was identified for 2018 under the 2017 financial plan. And um, this will help us establish an inventory of our natural, natural stormwater assets and provide recommendations on how to maintain these assets. Um, and we do expect we'll have two primary areas of focus, being Triangle Mountain, um, as well as Latoria at Vets Memorial Parkway there. And again, um, basically help us protect and enhance these natural assets, as well as some of our, our physical drainage infrastructure. Um, the subdivision bylaw review was started in 2017 and is carrying forward. Um, to 2018, and the uh, funding proposed is the carry forward funding available under what was approved in 2017. And this is to complete the rewrite um, of our existing subdivision and development bylaw that I believe was last updated in um, 1995. Uh, the next line, a traffic study. Um, this is a new project proposed. So in 2017, as we're well aware, we underwent a thorough process um, to revise our official community plan. Um, we also previously had a transportation master plan completed. So as a result of these initiatives, um, we now are looking to undertake a traffic study um, to understand the implications at Latoria and Vets Memorial Parkway, um, as well as some of the, the drainage implications of that area. Mr. Director Fryant. Thank you. I just want to make some final comments regarding some of the special projects here. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to point Council's attention to a theme that they might you might pick up with a lot of these special projects, and it will certainly become clear in the asset management and capital projects section of the budget, is that they're asset management driven and, uh, um, and, uh, and focused. Uh, for instance, our stormwater master plan, our pavement condition assessment, the geospatial survey. Um, a lot of these projects are proposed so that we can um, create and maintain a robust asset management program. And they're going to provide the information for us um, to populate in good, in good detail and um, with accuracy our five-year capital plans. Um, so this year is a little bit, I would say, of, of a reset for the city of Colwood so that we can um, put our information together um, so that we can have a, a, a coherent and a defensible capital plan moving forward. And so uh, I just wanted to mention that because you'll see the linkages as we move into the capital plan shortly after the operating budget discussions. Thank you. Thank you. And before we move it to the public, just wondering if the Director of Engineer had anything to add? Thank you. Through the chair, I'm more than happy to um, expand on any of the projects or uh, answer any questions that may arise. Okay. Um, Chris, did you have any questions or comments? Nope. 
So back to committee. Any questions, comments? Councillor Nall. Uh, yes, first a very easy one. On uh, page 43, under the uh, new operating budget items, you say 5.7% uh, uh, departmental increase, a 0.42% tax impact, and a $7.43 tax impact. Uh, how does that get calculated? Uh, through, through the chair. Um, wh what we've done is we've calculated an average single family dwelling property taxes. We've taken the uh, total dollar values as a proportion of that and um, arrived at $7.43. Okay, and what would the average uh, residential property assessment be? Uh, well, the, the municipal um, dollar value of what they pay in taxes is close to around $1,500. I forget the exact figure, but... It's, and that uh, that would not include the other taxing authorities on there as well. Okay, thank you. And uh, now the hard question. Um, under the DCC uh, bylaw review, um, I have some serious questions on how that is going to be uh, coordinated with the cross-sections as presented in the Transportation Master Plan and the uh, upcoming uh, Official Community Plan. It seems to me that those two would be driving the DCCs, and uh, there's I have some serious questions about the transportation master plan, and the OCP isn't going to even be adopted until well into the next budget year. How will we carry on that review? Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, the DCC bylaw review um, is primarily to match up where the roads that we believe are going to be most affected by growth to make sure that we have um, encapsulated th them into the DCC projects so that um, we can then apply DCC money to, to, to ensuring that those projects take place. Um, unfortunately, right now, um, our current list is very outdated and does not include the major roads that development will impact. And so the, pr the primary thrust of getting an updated DCC bylaw is just to ensure that um, we have at least a list of the roads and, and um, would then have the ability to match up the projects once they're ground truthed against the TMP. So um, I don't disagree with Councillor Nolt in that we have not necessarily um, ground truthed all of the projects and all of the cross sections that were in the TMP. That ground truthing did not happen prior to the TMP being uh, brought forward to council um, in 2015, I believe. Um, and uh, we would definitely have to marry up what those projects would look like um, with ground truthing, absolutely. But the main thrust of um, the DCC update is just to ensure that we can indeed put money towards upgrading roads that we believe will be impacted by um, development in the future. Thank you. And my concern was uh, doing a little bit of ground truthing of the transportation master plan myself with um, the uh, CRD local area, the atlases which shows property lines and so forth. There's an awful lot of the cross sections illustrated in that plan that we can't possibly build without expropriating land and uh, I don't think the city really wants to go down that route. Anyone else? Cynthia? Thank you. Um, I'd start with the um, engineering department operating budget, the first line uh, under funding is the right-of-way permit fees, for which the um, budget was 141000 and it's being increased this year by 2%. But the actual figures were significantly lower, and I'm just wondering why the budget is being raised by 2% when we haven't achieved the budget in the previous year. Uh, through the chair. That's a good question, and, and what um, what we've seen in these type of permit fees, fees is a lot of variability, and um, if we were able to provide a history prior to 2017, we would have seen many years that exceeded what the budget is as well. Um, so looking at um, the fees on a five-year scale, we felt it was, um, we were comfortable recommending a, a small increase. Thank you, and... Um 
in the accomplishments for 2017 um, and plans for 2018, uh, I understood we were going to uh, upgrade the light at Wishart and Machosen and install uh, another crosswalk. Currently, there's only a crosswalk on the north side and on the south side of the road, there is no crosswalk. Uh, on, uh, and I'm just wondering uh, if that is still planned. Through the chair, um, that has been completed. Wishart and Machosa now has uh, four crosswalks. Okay. Yes, yeah. Um, it was started in 2016. All the uh, um, part of the hardware was all installed. Um, so we just completed uh, a little bit of pa paving and some line painting, uh, and I think just two small lights. So that it was very um, quick, and you wouldn't even have noticed the change. It looks like it's been there forever, um, but it's in. Okay, so I, I just hadn't noticed it. And was there an upgrade to the light um, so that for the pedestrian crossing as well? Yeah, there's uh, a new um, walk signal there. And um, part of that project had the, the internal um, hardware of the, uh, the memory for the intersection was all replaced as well. Okay, so it should be operating more efficiently and effectively for cyclists, for example. That, that was an area where I heard an awful lot of complaints from cyclists who were unable to trigger the light. Um, cyclists on a sensor pad may still have difficulty if they can't find the pad. It still it hasn't, that hasn't been replaced for cyclists only. Um, it wasn't part of the project. Okay. so. So it is um, still problematic uh, then, I would assume I, I could check with some cyclists. There's a few at my house. Uh, I haven't asked them recently. Um, but they do use the area frequently. And it was uh, something that I had understood was going to be changed when the light was upgraded, that the um, sensor. So there is a little marking on the road where cyclists would have to put their bike in order to trigger the light. And previously, that was very intermittent. Um, I just had a, a, a couple more questions, um, and mostly related to page 45. Um, but um, this, at the bottom of page uh, 44, there's the geospatial survey um, of boulevard trees and ditches. And I'm just uh, on page the following page. There's the stormwater master plan, which um, is a comprehensive asset management and sustainable infrastructure project. So I'm just wondering why those two aren't together. Why, why the, uh, the, the um, geospatial survey isn't part of the stormwater master plan. Through the chair. Um, the stormwater master plan, how they collect the data would be um, brought forward by the consultant that would ultimately be um, hired through the RFP to provide that plan. Um, the geospatial uh, survey would use LIDAR to um, pinpoint the trees and pinpoint our ditches and be able to upload them into our GIS system quite quickly. So um, it would, they would absolutely complement each other. Um, however, the, um, it, we did not know um, when we were putting together the budget um, what the consultant would be coming up with. And this was a very quick and um, effective, both cost-wise and time-wise, way to get our tree assets in quite quickly into our GIS system so that we could have point assets associated with our trees and ditches. Okay, I'm just, I guess my, my comment would be that uh, I'm just uh, at $130,000 for the stormwater master plan. I'm just wondering why we wouldn't uh, detail what we're looking for and, and try to, uh, I guess, get two birds with one stone, if, if, you, if you get my meaning. Um, and... Uh, just in regards to the Ocean Boulevard Park and Ride, why is there $20,000 allocated to that? 
Uh, through the chair, um, the the project will capture costs associated with the creation of the city-owned lot in place of the previous roadway. So this necessitates a number of agreements, including final plans to be deposited at the Land Titles Office and multiple statutory rights of way for existing utilities and public use and enjoyment. For clarification, this expense is associated with the creation of the land asset as opposed to a road asset. So it, it does not, um, it has nothing to do with the future use of that asset, which is yes, yet to be determined. I understand. Um, and uh, it also mentions the rock face monitoring. Uh, which brought up for me um, a couple of other areas that I feel uh, need monitoring, uh, including the um, uh, what, what are essentially man-made rock cliffs, which are rock walls that have been created through development, and whether or not there's monitoring taking place on them as well. Through the chair, uh, yes. If the if the city is responsible for those uh, faces, so if it's a retaining wall, if it's a stacked rock wall, if it is a, um, and I'm I'm talking the very large ones like that that are on city property, those locations would be included in in this. So we would include um, both man-made and natural rock faces. Okay. And um, just because I haven't seen an update anywhere on it, um, uh, there was considerable discussion when Royal Bay brought forward their rezoning with regard to um, the foreshore monitoring that had been uh, supposed to be undertaken 20 years ago uh, and had lapsed and it was agreed that it had lapsed and it was going to be reinstated. And I'd just like to know if that uh, foreshore monitoring is being done. Through the chair, I do believe that the same company that we have um, contracted to do our coastline uh, erosion study has been contracted in the past, recent past, by uh, Royal Bay. Um, I would have to uh, defer to, unfortunately, a staff member that isn't here um, with regard to um, ongoing monitoring at that development. Great. Uh, I just wonder if maybe you could flag that and check into it. It was a condition of the original master development agreement that they would monitor uh, the uh, sand cliffs um, uh, adjacent to um, the, the foreshore. Uh, to determine uh, if there was slippage and what the rates were um, for our information. Anyone else? I'll let Rob go. Uh, so I, I'm trying to learn this budgeting process, so I, uh, if you can help me with this. Our previous, our previous uh, director of engineering would calculate in uh, labor costs of our own department into costs. So if a project was going to be $10,000 and it was going to be 100 hours of, of work internally, he would calculate that into it. So these numbers that I'm looking at, are there any staff costs or are these all external costs that would be like outside of in, in internal processes? Um, so just for clarification, um, the 2017 budget that I was not a part of, my predecessor um, was included. Um, those special projects and those capital projects did not include staff time. Okay. Well, to my, not, to my, my knowledge. I'm just trying to understand, yeah. do, do these numbers include any staff time? Like, are the, like when, when we say, for example, I'll just pick the first one, the crew, the, oh, that's probably a bad one. But, uh, well, okay, the development cost charged by law review, obviously, you would sit down with a consultant to, to do that. Is any of your time calculated in that dollar amount of 18,000 or is that just the external cost? Uh, for clarification through the chair, um, if the staff member is exempt, uh, those, those hours are not associated with any costs. It does change if Public Works is um, doing the project. Public Works costs would be associated. So for example, Last year, um, the work done in Havenwood Park 
the costs associated with that project do include public works time, but they would not include allocations for anybody that was uh, not um, an hourly wage worker. So in general, uh, through the chair, in general, looking at these line items, uh, is there much internal public works dollars that are being allocated or is, is all these line items mostly external? Through the chair, um, to clarify, they are mainly external. So yeah. public works is, is not associated with the majority of those. Okay. Uh, second question, if I may. Uh, so the only other question I have for you is, or I guess I, I, it's more of a philosophical concern that I have, is around the, <coughs> excuse me, pavement condition assessment. Um, we know that most of our roads are past uh, their lifespan. That, uh, and so we, we already know that. And I guess my challenge is, do we, why would we do an assessment before we actually have a, a long-term program in place? And do we have a long-term program in place that we're gonna spend a million a year to replace roads? Through the chair, um, the assessment does two things. One is it will rank all of our roads on the basis of condition. But the other thing it does is it gives us an updated costing of how much it would cost to bring the road up to a better standard. So currently, we do not have that listing. So right now, we, d we do do um, ad hoc repairs to the roads, but they are not based on a plan that, that was based on road condition and, and a a PCI index. So we'll be, we would ha historically have done it based on the good judgment of public works. And there's, I am definitely not in any way stating that that was not good judgment. Um, but this way we would have empirical, uh, an empirical condition assessment provided by a, th a third party that um, would provide us with a lot more data with which to make some future decisions and that would populate the five-year plan based on a condition index, which we currently do not have. So, oh, go ahead, Chris. Sorry. If I may add through the chair, thank you very much. Uh, f from the finance department's perspective as well, this sort of study provides a long-term picture of the sustainable infrastructure replacement funding needs, which uh, you don't get without having an empirical um, analysis done. So. Not only will this provide um, the engineering department with uh, short-term operating uh, uh, and capital needs, but it also uh, helps us look many decades into the future and plan for um, the funding of that in, in the long term. Okay. Thank you. And I, get, I guess my comment, uh, and I, I don't disagree with anything that anybody said. I guess my more concern is from a philosophical standpoint on a council level that we need to be prepared that we need to put a program in place to begin uh, to replace these roads. My concern is that we built, we spend $76,000 uh, on a report, but then we never fund it uh, after the fact to actually fix any of the roads that, that we have. And so why spend the money <coughs> getting the assessment telling us if we're never going to actually invest into replacing those or fixing those roads. And through the chair, this will provide us with um, numbers for a five-year plan. So it will provide a lot more detail for council to deliberate on, on how we fund and how we prioritize um, funding our roads. Jason? Um, yeah, one comment and then one question. I, I think uh, the councillor to my left is quite correct. When I started on council in uh, 2000, we had a computer program that had all of the roads listed and when they were going to need maintenance and, you know, prioritize them and all of that. And council of the day continually slashed road maintenance budget. So we had a wonderful plan, but none of it was ever acted upon. And I, I, I share his concerns that... Uh, we're going to have this wonderful plan, and council is going to take one look at the cost of it <laughs> <laughs> and say, well, no way. And, and this is not just a Collard problem. This is a problem across our entire nation. So just a caution on that one. Um, my other question was jumping to the plans for 2018. Um, 
One of the items was design traffic calming solutions for Lagoon, Melbourne, Ocean Boulevard area if a survey indicates neighborhood support. Now, given the new policy says if we're going to put in traffic calming, we have to look at the effect at all of the adjacent streets and so forth. Um, do we have money in the budget to actually do any of that, or is that the kind of we'll plan it and we'll again wait for the funds to materialize? Uh, through the chair, we do have some funding available. Um, we it it's a bit of chicken and egg, absolutely. Um, we are definitely embarking on working with the director of communications on, uh, sorry, the the manager of communications on uh, perfecting our survey. We're, we'll put that survey out. Um, but this is for d a design. Um, so essentially. Um, we would design first and impl implement later. Uh, you'll recall that uh, we would also be putting in temporary traffic calming measures before we put in permanent. Um, so it, it we definitely do have some budget, whether it will be enough to um, implement the design as it finally stands uh, would be updated in the next budget, but w we're not trying to build it as a Cadillac. We just needed a placeholder to ensure that we actually had funding to start the program. Cynthia? Thanks, uh, just brought up a question for me on the pavement condition assessment, uh, whether or not this would affect the DCC bylaw. Depending on what the assessment says, it might, but Chances are it wouldn't because the DCC program is meant to fund um, an, a, an increase associated with um, growth. This is, this is basically we have our roads and, and we are duty bound to maintain them to, to some degree. And so unless it ended up showing that the combination of the road and the growth associated with perhaps upgrading a road from a local road to a collector road, for example, um, that may play in, but honestly, the, the pavement assessment program is not meant to um, drive the DCC program because it is a snapshot in time with regard to where we need to maintain our roads today. Right, just uh, it has been uh, previously uh, a large bone of contention at, at the council table, uh, truck traffic and uh, the, the amount of wear and tear on certain roads. And uh, I certainly uh, see um, a considerable amount of wear and tear happening on roads that didn't used to have that type of wear and tear on them. So I just thought that that might show, I mean, I'm sure growth is maybe different, but uh, a road can still only take, you know, 100,000 or 100 million, whatever it is, car trips on it before it needs to be replaced, before that, you know, is worn out and potholy and whatever pavement is, is cracked and, and so forth. So I'm sure age also um, is a big factor, but I just thought that maybe uh, the pavement condition might uh, in some cases in Colwood, I'm thinking of truck routes particularly, uh, show uh, or routes that are intermunicipal, uh, show the volume wear and tear as well as the age wear and tear. Through the chair, um, it may highlight uh, increased wear and tear, but that n would not necessarily translate into a DCC eligible project. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, just wanting to double check. Okay, nothing. Okay, so we'll move on to the next um, capital budget presentation. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm going to begin at the capital deliberations with mm -hmm. a, a brief, very brief um, 
presentation on asset management, and I'm encouraged to hear some of the conversation around the council table today about um, the practicality around infrastructure um, funding. And uh, in my experience, um, this is something that all communities are dealing with, their infrastructure that they have and their underlying obligation to maintain that infrastructure. And how do you, f how do you fund it sustainably? Um, most recently, our work, in, uh, um, our work at Central Sandage um, outlined a roadmap to sustainable funding. So it is something that's possible. Uh, it does um, depend on council commitment and, and vision. Um, but let's go through some of the information here and, and see what you have to uh, say about it. So currently we maintain, uh, own, um, are obligated with a number of assets that we have. And this is our current inventory. We've got 58 million worth of land. That would include the land underneath the roads. That would include the land underneath the facilities, the land underneath uh, that makes up the parks. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, land in our inventory. Um, we have $5.8 million worth of buildings. And keep in mind, these dollar values are what did we pay for them when we originally acquired them. So they could be quite out of date in many, in many circumstances. And this information is what's disclosed in our financial statements. Um, $9 million worth of vehicles and equipment, $32 million worth of storm and sanitary uh, pipes and ditches and et cetera, um, $2.8 million worth of park infrastructure, $70 million worth of roads, and on a consolidated basis, we um, have $14.7 million worth of assets at the West Shore Parks and Rec Society. That facility is worth a lot more than that, but that's our proportional shares as we report um, according to our accounting, uh, our accounting standards. So you can see we have um, a huge envelope of assets that the city maintains to provide valuable services to, um, to its citizens. And... Um, Asset management has become a uh, focus by local governments in the, in the recent decade, I would say, especially when um, public sector accounting centers were changed for us to include considerations of assets and its amortization or financial statements. Um, mind you, you can, you can just tell by the uh, inventory of assets that we uh, maintain and oversee, uh, it really should be... Uh, an everyday consideration to uh, to the city. It's an essential uh, service that we provide. So this is what I'm going to talk about, um, and this is very high level projections at the moment, and we can refine this information with the various asset management studies that have been proposed in this financial plan and future financial plans. So this line here represents something that's called amortization, and it's essentially a measure of how quickly our assets are wearing out. It's a measure that we include in our financial statements. And so right now that's about $2.5 million. So essentially what amortization is, say we purchase a road, we construct a road for $50 million. That road has a 50-year useful life. We'll recognize in our financial statements $1 million worth of amortization every single year. So amortization is essentially the amount that we should be funding every year, assuming that there's no inflation whatsoever. And, of course, that's a very uh, optimistic assumption, which isn't uh, in line with reality. This is what our transfer to reserves funding has been over the last number of years. So you see we're funding at a lower level than even amortization is. Now, I don't know where the – I don't know exactly where the sustainable funding level is. Um, that's what we are uh, wanting to determine with the various um, asset management um, programs that we would like to undertake in the next uh, in the next year but I suspect somewhere around here that would be around four million dollars if you um, if you uh, include actual replacement costs in there so that's about a two million dollar gap and we could solve that this year if we want to impose a 15 percent tax increase um, but and that might seem daunting sorry hold on you just have a yes. question I'm really curious where that $4 million estimate comes from. I mean, if we take the total inventory of $200 million and replace that over four, 50 years, that works out to $4 million. But land doesn't depreciate. Parks don't depreciate. I mean, the roads certainly do, and the vehicles do, and the storm sewers do, but the big chunk of this is land, and it appreciates in value. It does not depreciate. 
So I'm just curious where the four million came from. Absolutely, and right now it's a very high level estimate, and when we are able to refine the data, that will adjust accordingly. But in my experience, um, sustainable funding levels have been between um, one and a half to two and a half times where the amortization is on average. So it fits within that fits within that um, um, uh, with those limits. But really, we don't we don't know. Even even when we get um, good empirical evidence to support what those sustainable levels are, they're going to be a bit of prediction. What is the inflation going to be in future years? Um, are costs of a certain asset going to decline or reduce? So there's always going to be a bit of a prediction there. So I'm saying $2 million, uh, that's a 15% tax increase and uh, something that we can uh, work on closing in, in the future uh, if that's what we want to do. Now, in other municipalities, the what happens typically with a lot of infrastructure is when we have a large infrastructure project, from the get-go, we take out debt. And we pay that debt over usually uh, an amortization period that is less than its useful life. So we have an opportunity, once that debt has been paid off, to start funding the future replacement of that. And so that has caused most municipalities and other uh, public agencies to have a bit of a, a bit of a deficit. It doesn't mean that we need to pa panic. It doesn't mean that um, the roads are crumbling outside or any of our infrastructure is, but we can take steps to uh, gradually um, close that gap um, without impacting the taxpayer in a, a significantly negative way and in a short period. So the next thing I want to do is just talk about what our asset management looks like. And for those following along, it'd be page 55 of the uh, financial plan, page 73 of the agenda. We get, a lot of we get a lot of comments and questions from the public and from staff. What are we doing for asset management? And uh, you know, our answer has, has been we've got a lot of sort of scattered things going on. Here's a good overview of everything that we got going on and some of the things that we could focus on in the short term. Um, to have a comprehensive asset management plan. You'll notice, for instance, we don't uh, have much of a plan for, for building um, replacement. We might have a maintenance plan for the current building that we have, um, but a long-term plan for buildings doesn't, uh, doesn't exist. One of the uh, groups of assets that I will comment on about uh, that we're doing very well in is our fleet. And you can see there we've got a fire fleet, we've got a general fleet, and we've got a sewer fleet. And all three of those um, have uh, very detailed plans in place with a, fund a specific funding in the financial plan and historical funding in the plan. And most of them are sustainable. The only, the only uh, uh, fleet replacement funding that currently is not f uh, sustainable is, is sewer. And, and we discussed that at the last council meeting. We have a plan to become sustainable within three years. Um, we just wanted to mitigate the impact in one year to the ratepayer, so it's currently not sustainable. Our IT equipment um, this year we've uh, um, we've uh, designed the IT uh, equipment replacement such that is sustainable. So we've introduced a, a, a transfer to reserve for all IT PCs as well as um, the uh, network infrastructure, and that is sustainable. With all of our other assets. Um, so, you know, some uh, the, the the remainder are not sustainable, but we have um, plans um, to provide information so that we can get there. Uh, take for instance drainage. We've just introduced um, this idea of a stormwater master plan. If we conduct a stormwater master plan, that can outline um, uh, sustainable funding levels in the future and what work needs to be undertaken in in the short term uh, to get to a sustainable level. Parks. There's a um, parks master plan proposed in 2019. Roads, the pavements condition assessment will provide that information as I commented on earlier. So uh, from a comprehensive view, the city's doing quite well to address um, our asset management priorities. And uh, it can't all be done at once, but it's being done bit by bit. Now, I, I'm, I'm prepared to launch right into the capital plan. I just wanted to provide that bit of a, a context to it because um, our asset management should drive what our capital plan um, outlines in many ways. Before I do that, i uh, wondering if council or the public has any questions. Committee? Jason? 
Yes, I'm uh, just curious as to what level of debt the city is carrying right now and um, how much of that we're paying off, because it seems to me that paying off debt on assets is, is part of your sustainable uh, plan, and the uh, capital, the five-year financial plan shows debt interest of $581,000 for this year, so that's a good chunk of your $2 million shortfall fall right there. I'm just curious what level of debt servicing we are doing. Uh, through the chair, right now um, we have about $10.8 million worth of debt. Um, much of that is related to the local service areas, and so it's supported by local service area uh, parcel taxes. Um, some of it, though, is, is related to general, uh, to general expenditures, such as uh, um, the uh, West Shore Parks and Rec uh, facilities. Um, which is supported by taxes. So it, it going forward, whenever um, debt is retired that is funded by taxes, it would be my recommendation to um, not reduce the taxes but uh, continue with a transfer to reserves for sustainable funding. So I guess my question with that is uh, having just recently managed to pay off all of my sewer debt in my area, uh, I really appreciated when my tax bill went down. So you're saying that you would expect me to continue paying those taxes and putting it into general revenue when nobody else in Colwood is paying those? Through the chair, uh, the uh, local service area is a bit unique. No, so the answer to your question is no, I wouldn't expect you to continue because remember this, uh, the local service area taxes is funded by the parcel tax. So that would discontinue. That was part of signing up for the local service area tax, right? I can now um, buy into this uh, local service area, and once the debt is paid off, it's no longer due. I'm talking more about the debt that is funded by general taxation, um, not the parcel taxation. So uh, if, now this isn't the case, but uh, as an example, if we were to purchase a fire truck and take out debt to fund the purchase of the fire truck, um, after that debt has been paid off, I would recommend maintaining those sustainable levels uh, to a, for a transfer reserve rather than reducing taxes by 1% or 2% um, and not funding future replacement of that asset. Well, my impression is we were already doing that in an example of something like a fire truck where it now goes, if it's paid off, it goes into the fleet replacement fund. So you can't spend that money twice. Correct. My example, <laughs> I, was tr I was trying to illustrate an example, but you're absolutely right because when we get to the fire, fire fleet, it is funded by reserve because we have sustainably saved for it. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Um, we could I just, uh, just had one, uh, which is really, it, it seems to me uh, that when we get to the point of uh, asset management actions taking place, most of the action seems to be to establish reserves for the for the future expenditure that we can calculate will be needed. Um, but I'm not sure that I can think of anything, and uh, I'd, I'd be interested to know if you can, anything that we uh, have borrowed money for uh, that is paid for through general taxation. So currently approximately 30% of our long-term debt is funding um, items other than our sewer local area services. So specifically, um, we have a number of equipment finance loans for City Fleet. Um, we took on debt to fund the Bear Mountain Arena. We've taken on debt to fund um, Knob Hill intersection works that occurred about 10 or 15 years ago or so. Um, some Triangle Mountain works that occurred before my time as well. And those debts are not yet paid off? Like I'm thinking Knob Hill Ocean Boulevard, that is 15 years ago. Correct, not yet. We're coming close to um, Bear Mountain Arena. We're still, off the top of my head, I think about 10 years out. Yeah. It would be, um, I think, just a good idea maybe for a future uh, budget or, or presentation. Uh, you know, some of us who have mortgages have mortgage burning parties or 
you know, when our mortgage is paid off. Uh, I think the city should celebrate a little bit when some of our long-term debt is, is retired, not because we're necessarily going to stop um, um, that taxation uh, in terms of we may be directing that towards reserve funds, uh, but uh, in terms of just celebrating that well, we, we're done with that part. I like that suggestion. Rob? Uh, thank you. Can you, um, you mentioned that we have $10.8 million worth of debt long-term, uh, or I don't know if it's long-term, short-term. Do you know what our cap is right now? Uh, through the chair, just let me uh, read my notes here. We are about approximately at 34% of our borrowing limit, so okay. 30, 30 million. Yeah. And, and what, uh, and do you have, uh, excuse me, through the chair to, to our director of finance, do you have a goal at all of where you would like that number to be, percentage-wise? Uh, through the chair, no. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> I, don't, I haven't developed a specific goal, but when I recommend at some point sustainable infrastructure replacement funding, I would want to demonstrate um, the money that is spent on debt interest servicing that could otherwise be saved by um, sustainable infrastructure spending instead. Thank you. That's a, a huge improvement from uh, when I first started on council. I think we had about 90% uh, of our, or 95% of our uh, borrowing capacity used up mostly by the sewer uh, infrastructure. Uh, what I would like to see, though, as, as a suggestion, uh, now that we have a functioning finance department, when you bring forward your quarterly reports to council or committee, uh, if we could have a summary of what the debts are and where we stand in paying them off, it would be very useful for the future planning to know that. Any other suggestions or comments? Questions? No? Nope? Okay, we can carry on. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So uh, what we're going to begin with then, we're going to launch into the uh, uh, capital budget and we're going to start with road infrastructure. Road infrastructure can be found on page 78 of the uh, agenda or page 60 of the financial plan. And the way th uh, that we're going, that I plan to conduct this, if at any point council wants to interrupt me with questions, by all means. Um, otherwise, I'm going to introduce all of the projects related to road infrastructure, much like we did with all the special projects related to engineering, and then um, have a, uh, some time at the end for public questions and for, for, for questions as well. A number of the capital projects within the road infrastructure capital project are carryovers. So for those that are carried over and, and work is continuing, that my comments will probably be brief. Um, but I will, I will ensure that uh, uh, if there's anything new in there that we'll comment on that as well. Okay, so beginning with uh, road infrastructure, um, we have a Machosen Road Bike Lane uh, uh, capital project proposed for $120,000. And this is a carryover, so it was approved for $140,000, I believe, in the 2017 financial plan, 20 of which have been uh, spent. Uh, moving on, we have, yes, sir. Uh, for w when, excuse me, through the chair, when you're doing this, could you could you also explain <coughs> or just mention so that I don't ask the question after the fact, <coughs> how much of that is is material? How much of that? Not excuse me, I'm not interested in material, but what I'm interested in is is any of that labor cost. Is that any uh, like is is any of these numbers that we're going to be looking at internal city labor cost? Uh, through the chair. Um, I can probably provide some information on some of them. So the Machosen Road bike lanes, that will have labor cost in it. That is actually a public works project. Um, Machosen Road Hatley to Lagoon will have very minor public works um, expenditure in it. Uh, that is mainly um, contracted out. Um, Machosen Road uh, Ben Homer to Cotlow Design will is will have only um, exempt staff, so it will not be reflected in that. Um, the design, anything that's got design on it, that, that will not have um, labor costs associated with public works. Um, bus stop improvements likely will not, but we have not um, gone through the process of um, 
tendering that out yet. It may have a component, it may not, depending on, on the quotes that we get back, um, should Council uh, endorse that project. Lagoon Bridge repairs um, would be contracted out. Um, so no uh, hourly wages there. Uh, Ocean Boulevard Gate will likely ha uh, have a combination, um, may or may not. It would, again, depend on, on uh, what the RFP would bring or the ITT would bring in this matter. Um, Souk at Machosan Service Pole would have very minor, if any, um, public works involvement there. Um, bridge and culvert repair upgrades, um, it's... Uh, would have some, um, I would argue that perhaps 20% may be um, associated with public works. Uh, traffic calming, um, we've talked about it before, we're not entirely certain. Um, this is going to be the, the first year, so um, we may find that um, our forces can, can uh, help us a lot in that, or we may find that it might be more cost-effective to contract out, so that one is a bit up in the air. Wayfinding signage, um, that would be uh, our forces putting in the signs. Um, this is a project that is spearheaded by communications department, so it'll probably be a combination of um, some consultants. Uh, it, we do not manufacture um, signs in-house for wayfinding signs, so um, that part would be contracted out, but definitely putting them in would be our resources. Uh, speed reader signs, um, a very small portion of those to put them up would be um, public works. The streetlight upgrades would not include any um, public works. Uh, Lookout Brook safety upgrades, a very minor portion um, will include some staff costs, um, because we um, have some SIM cards and things like that that uh, would be put in um, quite possibly by Public Works um, and some minor, minor works associated with uh, putting in some monitoring equipment. The, the bulk of that would not be um, in-house. Um, again, design work would not be done in-house with um, Public Works or um, uh, hourly rate employees. Um, the Latoria Road uh, Wishart to VMP bike lanes, um, that one is, is essentially um, filling in the gaps uh, between um, the infrastructure that we have. Um, that may or may not be associated with that. That is a 2020 project. Again, it will be um, how, what the final design is and whether or not our, um, our Public Works could I install that or whether they would be either too busy or it would not be um, applicable to their work. Um, bike lanes would be similar and that is of course in 2021. And the Machosan Road Souk to a shirt design um, that would entirely be outside forces and that is 2022 project. Thank you. Sorry, my question was kind of similar, so I thought this might be a good time to uh, put it in. Um, I'm curious to know what the associated ongoing maintenance costs are that are associated with the projects that we're talking about. Uh, for example, when we put in uh, the bike lanes, there's an expectation that we will keep them swept and clear of debris. Uh, and as we get more and more of them, that's going to be requested more and more. Um, so I'd just like to know kind of incrementally uh, what this is doing to our base budget. Uh, through the chair. Um, that is a weakness with, uh, to be honest, to be completely honest, that is a weakness with this financial plan. Um, when the department submit capital budget project requests, they are required to um, estimate the incremental increase to operating costs. And, and uh, the finance department does, that ta does take that into uh, uh, consideration when preparing the five-year uh, operating financial plan. So they have been incorporated. However, um, what 
we really wanted to do, and we unfortunately just didn't have an opportunity to get it done, was to outline the new capital services that are being proposed and what the incremental increase is as a re result of that. So both the, the, the public and council could be uh, uh, being made keenly aware of that. So uh, unfortunately that, detail, that level of detailed information isn't, isn't provided uh, uh, right now. Through the chair, S Cynthia, most of the um, new bike lanes are already on main roads that are currently on a sweeping route, so no additional cost for street sweeping. Um, would be a little bit of line painting uh, at that wouldn't do very much at this point. Just uh, if I uh, just throw it out there because I was just driving through out the capital region today, noticing uh, the bike lanes are all in terrible shape at this time of year. It's, it's uh, very diff difficult for cyclists. It, it's, it's, uh, um, uh, it's a real hazard. It's not a discomfort. It, it's a serious hazard. So uh, I just put it out there that um, I don't know who has the magic answer. Nobody that I've seen has the magic answer. But somehow uh, bike lanes come, come last. And I see more and more people using them, and uh, I've seen more and more people injured in them uh, as a result of debris. Any other comments or questions? Yeah, yeah, sorry, and I apologize, Chris. I know you had a plan and I'm messing it up. I'm, uh, what I'm trying to understand is where do I see my labor costs? So for example, the park, Parks Department, or the Public Works Department, excuse me. So I, I've just I heard through our Director of Engineering, for example, there was one where she, I, I can't even remember the line item, but she mentioned that, that it's 20%, so which was about $14,000. And I'm trying to understand, okay, that's $14,000 of internal cost, and is that number already rolled into our labor costs, or is that $14,000 that's on top of what are already our core labor cost is for, for public works? I'm, I'm getting confused on, on how we're budgeting labor. <laughs> Through the chair, um, we use the same scarce resources. So if public works is work, because they um, allocate their time hourly, if they are working on a capital project, um, they allocate their time to that capital project, um, which means, of course, that they're not allocating their time to a maintenance contract. So there are some sort of swings and balances there. We have to allocate some type of um, labor cost to the project simply because if we don't get public works to, to do that work, we have to contract it out. So that's a partial answer to your, to your question. Um, so wh what we tend to do is we budget for uh, and I'm sure Chris is just itching to, to get in here on it. Um, but we do, t we do um, tend to budget for um, what it costs to operate. So our, our general operating budget, we, we have to budget um, accordingly for that. But if we use public works for any of our capital projects, that it the, m the hours that are associated with that do tend to go over to the capital project as opposed to, um, so you'll see what you'll see is an increase in the capital project numbers associated with public works and a, a resulting decrease in the operational side of things. So we're definitely not double counting them because there would be a savings on one side but that savings comes at a bit of a cost because they're not doing something else because we're using those same scarce resources. I'll let um, Chris dovetail into what I'm saying. Yes, uh, thank you, through the, through the chair. Um, now, in general, I can say that for most of the um, capital budgets, there's very little labor consideration because a lot of it is contracted, a lot of it is design, a lot of it is not actual uh, shovels in the ground sort of work. But best practices with this, uh, it's just not the situation w where we're at. You want to ensure that the core operating budgets maintain a service level, and that service level is defined by council and influenced by council. And we don't want to um, 
to, in, in order to maintain those service levels, we don't want to significantly shift those resources to a capital project because then you're not meeting the targets within that operating budget. Um, fact of the matter is, we don't have a flexible, casual pool in public works. I'm just looking over at Mr. Miles. And quite often that is what is utilized in, in a public works department. They will increase staffing seasonally and allocate that staffing to the capital budget and they'll maintain the, the operating uh, budget as it stands in its static form at the service level that it is. Um, so that's the normal process. In, in, in this case, if any um, labor is used to support some of the capital projects, you will see a decrease in the actuals in the operating budget, and so you would have uh, a lower than, uh, um, than budget over there. So uh, will I see that shift number after this is approved or has, has the assumptions been made that, that everything's getting approved and so when I look at the public works labor number, that number has already been calculated in the, of the shift? You should assume um, to, to your best ability <laughs> that um, the operating budgets, the year to date and then the next year um, should be similar to what the budget budget was. As I mentioned, there's very little labor that's been allocated to these capital projects. Uh, and please correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, uh, there's very little uh, public works labor that have been uh, allocated this, to this capital project. So, any, um, so there won't be much labor shifted to the capital projects, and so the operating budget year-to-date should be similar to the actuals. Now, there's always, there's always going to be reasons that drive variances, staff vacancy, something happens. That is outside of what I'm saying here. Uh, for further clarification through the chair, the only significant public works input capital project is the carryover from the Machosen Lane, uh, Machosen Road bike lanes. That is that is the fundamental public works capital project. lost my place. <laughs> um, no, what I'll do is I, um, I, I'm going to go through some of these, uh, um, most of these capital projects that remain. We've already discussed some of them, uh, provided a few comments, and again, we'll get back if there's any, any questions regarding that. Um, so I was going to continue by commenting on the Machosen Road, Lagoon to Hatley Road, and Council um, will recall that this is a carryover budget. Much of that budget has been spent I think it was a $911,000 overall budget. The remaining is $168,000, and so that will continue into 2018. Yes. Now, uh, the, ne the next project there, Machosen Road, Ben Homer to Cotlow Design. And Council will again recognize this pattern that I've, I would discussed earlier prior to the asset management conversation. There's not a lot of populated numbers of shovel-ready projects 2019 through 2022, and we've deliberately um, this year as a management team uh, made the conscious choice that we don't want to put placeholder budget in there. We want to have uh, defensible numbers. We want to have um, studies that support those uh, capital projects. And until we have that information available, we're not going to populate the, the financial plan. And um, uh, unfortunately, we've got some work to do in our asset management. And so there's, um, there's some areas that haven't populated. So this project here, the Chosen Road, Ben Homer to Cotlow and Design, is, um, uh, comes out of our transportation master plan. We don't know what the costs are going to be, but we need to, uh, to ask that a design um, be undertaken prior to that. Um, and if you have any questions about what the order of magnitude might be for those actual uh, upgrades, um, Nick will be available to answer some questions with regard to that. Uh, the same thing can be said about the Painter Road upgrade design. We've got a budget of $79,000. Uh, we don't know whether this design might be a bit more or a bit less than the other one, but that's that's a ballpark of the design. And this uh, project as well uh, comes out of the, transport uh, the transportation master plan. Next project there is the bus stop improvement. And Council may recall uh, in 2017 when uh, the city decided to end a third-party contract for installation and maintenance of the 23 benches. Um, and um, the advertising that occurred at those benches um, helped offset the costs of the third-party 
uh, contractor uh, maintaining that. And so this project would replace that by um, providing, uh, a, a constructing uh, accessible pads uh, in those and maintaining those on an ongoing basis. So here's an example of what Councillor Day was referring to. Um, this will result in additional operating costs um, because now they're going to be maintained by the Public Works Department instead of a third party. Um, and so although I, don't, I haven't outlined specifically what those operating costs are, Council should uh, um, keep that in mind when approving such a capital project. Next project on the list, uh, Lagoon Bridge Repairs. Uh, and this, um, uh, this is ongoing repairs that are a result of inspection reports. And um, you may recall in the engineering operating budget, those inspection reports um, are ongoing in, in, in the operating budget. Um, I will note, however, that the this is a capital project that was approved in 2017, but 30,000. But this is $30,000 in excess of what the 2017 budget was approved. So some work has been done, uh, but overall, approving this $113,000 would be $30,000 in excess. Um, reason being is that the structural the, the structural engineer um, identified some further repairs that they recommended be done uh, at that uh, on the bridge. Next project on the list, the Ocean Boulevard Gate. And in light of the recent um, tsunami warning that occurred, um, uh, staff are recommending that gates be installed, um, one at the bottom of Ocean Boulevard and Lagoon, and one at the bottom of or, or near Fort Rod Hill. And that would allow public work staff to close access to those roads in the case of an emergency or a, a storm event or any uh, sort of thing like that. Uh, the next uh, item on deck here is uh, the bridge and uh, culvert repairs. So this is uh, very much related to the lagoon bridge repairs. Um, as you, uh, uh, you may recall, the um, city has the inspections um, conducted on the bridge and uh, pedestrian culverts as well as the lagoon bridge. And that uh, study recommends uh, ongoing maintenance, and this is uh, ongoing maintenance in um, in, in line with that plan. Now, the proposal is for $71,500 for 2018, and that's because there's a carryover of uh, some of the repairs that were not undertaken in 2017 that, uh, that would like to be uh, continued into 2018. Um, this is an item, so uh, onto traffic calming, we discussed this item a little bit earlier, and the, the question was posed, is there any money in the budget? And so there is some money in the budget. It's just uncertain the scope of what's going to be needed because it is a new policy and it is a new program. In 2018, we're re recommending $34,000. That is uh, a, a, a 2017 carryover plus what was recommended in the 2018 year that was in the 2017 plan as well. Wayfinding uh, signage. Um, uh, this is an ongoing budget uh, item, and again, um, uh, managed Sorry, by Chris, the... Chris, excuse yes. me. I do have a question here. Sorry, just you've mentioned a couple of items that have carryover from the previous year, and I'd just like to know where to find that on the... Because there is nothing on my page that indicates what's carried forward from last year. Through the chair, yeah, there is no indication. Uh, just what I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, we did prepare uh, quarter three reports that indicated where we thought we were going to be at the end of the year. Um, ultimately, what we would like to do going forward for council is to provide a, a quarter three report with um, year and projections, and that would provide us with an estimated carryover that would occur in the next budgeting cycle. So it won't come as a surprise to council that something has been carried over, and the magnitude of it should be disclosed at an earlier time. If I could just follow up on that from my perspective, I would like to see uh, carryover um, only done with council endorsement. Uh, it, I, I don't think that's just a staff initiative. Uh, I think that needs to be a, a council direction. Through the chair, for clarification, there are four capital um, expenditures that are carryover. Um, the Machosen Road bike lanes, the Machosen Road Lagoon to Hatley, um, and that the carryover is simply because the construction 
um, of that of that road just moved from the bulk of it was done in 2017, but um, to finish it was 2018 because it started it it just the construction schedule didn't adhere to a calendar, um, like a calendar uh, year. The traffic calming um, is carryover, and um, that one um, we brought forward a a new um, policy for, so that that was definitely identified as as carryover. Um, the streetlight upgrades, um, the LED program, um, has a component of carryover as well, and um, that that one, um, all, all four of them were identified um, as being potentially carried over uh, last year, um, and I'm not in any way stating that we wouldn't continue to ensure that council is, is, is well aware of those, but of them, um, four are carryover. Thank you, and if I may uh, distinguish a little bit, there's a further distinguish, distinguishing that we should do with uh, capital uh, budget carryovers. For instance, the um, Machosan Road Lagoon to Hatley project is an example of something that is well underway, and um, uh, city staff are working and continuing with that project under the authority of the current bylaw, which is of 2017. But in the case where we've, where council has approved something in 2017, hasn't begun, and we're asking for that funding in 2018 in addition to an amount, uh, it's more than appropriate to ask for council endorsement at that time. And, and essentially, the approval of the financial plan is that endorsement when, when, and if, when that uh, occurs later on. Okay, so I'll, I'll continue um, uh, into the speed reader uh, signs. Um, so the plan is to install, install a speed reader at David Cameron School in 2018, and the, the further um, budget uh, after that uh, is to be, to be determined. I, I arrived for work early today, so I didn't get the smiley face because I guess it's the 8 the eight, p 8 a.m. thing out front, so I was looking for the smiley face. Yeah, uh, yeah I didn't get that one. <laughs> Uh, the streetlight upgrades LED program. So as uh, um, uh, Nikki uh, mentioned, uh, there is a carryover component to this. There is also uh, a general streetlight repairs and maintenance component of this. So the full, it's about $35,000 on an annual basis, isn't all related to the LED streetlight. However, the LED streetlight component uh, staff have calculated an estimate of uh, between a, a five and a 10 year return on that investment. Um, due to consumption savings, and the, the, um, the lifespan certainly ex exceeds that of, the, of those, um, uh, uh, those uh, bulbs. The Lookout uh, Brum da uh, Brook Dam safety upgrade. So council may recall uh, in last year, um, a, a dam stability analysis was conducted and uh, um, with the intention of providing further recommendations to council. The council has not seen that um, report. It just recently, it was submitted to the city. Um, so this is a bit of a chicken and an egg thing because um, that, that report um, recommends um, design, design work. Um, so again, because you don't have that information before you, I, uh, it's a chicken and egg um, situation. But before any design work would occur, they should, uh, assuming that a council approves this budget, should any d design work occur, um, council would still have a full opportunity to uh, approve that project through the normal um, RFP process and, and, uh, uh, and presentation to council. The Machosan Road Wishart to Painter Design is also a project that comes out of the transportation uh, master plan. Um, there are some specific traffic signal upgrades um, that also come out of the um, uh, transportation master plan. However, the 2020 figure represents d uh, design only. The Latoria uh, Road Wishart to uh, uh, VMP bike lanes is also a project that is recommended out of the transportation master plan. Um, and uh, uh, the bike bike lanes is a is a placeholder budget in 2021. 
And lastly, on the road infrastructure list is the Chosen Road Souk to Wishart design, again, another project that has come out of the Transportation Master Plan. So with that, I'll uh, ask if Council the Public has any uh, questions before I move on to the next capital project. Thank you. Chris. I recognize that this isn't probably um, relevant to budgeting specifically, um, but having had some experience with gates being closed to restrict access, uh, I'm familiar with the situation that occurred where people were actually trapped behind a locked gate. So hopefully when we design that gate, there's a way for somebody in the middle of the night that we didn't see um, that might have been trapped to drive a vehicle out really quickly if they need to get out of an area that's starting to flood or something like that. Thanks. Can staff just comment on that, please? Through the chair, um, the premise of the gates was to um, allow public works to have the ability to close down a section of the road um, so that they didn't have to use their vehicles to, to block access. So um, it, it was not uh, necessarily meant to close the road for specific ongoing um, parts of the day, S um, which I mean, uh, ultimately, I guess it could be used for that. But generally speaking, um, when Public Works closes down the road right now, they um, do a sweep. We make sure that all the other vehicles are, are, are gone from the road. But then we have to actually station two units, one on either side, to make sure that cars don't go into our zone. And this would prevent us from having to do that. We could then use our trucks to do other important duties that would be required at, at the same time. Generally speaking, if everything's um, all, if there's a lot of havoc going on uh, on the lagoon, chances are there's havoc going on in other areas of the, the city, and we could probably use those vehicles to, to do something else as opposed to try to, to simply block a road. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. And my concern would be sort of envisioning there's a tsunami warning and there's a bunch of cars parked down there in the middle of the evening and someone does a sweep and doesn't necessarily get every vehicle or sees a vehicle with no occupants that we don't know whether they've actually left the area or not. Who knows what the situation might be. They then discover, hey, there's an issue with the tsunami coming. They get into their vehicle and they realize they can't leave the area safely. That was my concern, not sort of the day-to-day, -day, hey, we're going to close it for whatever maintenance reason or something like that. Thanks. Cynthia? Thanks. Just a question on uh, the traffic signal upgrades uh, that are for 2019 and then 2020. I would assume that's more than one in 2019. Uh, through the chair, let me grab another book I have here. It's it's underneath the desk, so um, let me <laughs> let me let me uh, flip through that to uh, answer your question. <laughs> if I could just comment, um, uh, 2019 was for Souk and Machosen and Souk and Aldine. And the 2020 was for design work. <laughs> Anyone else? Jason? Um, just a general question. We have an awful lot of money dedicated uh, this year, last year, and in coming years to bike lanes. Do we have any measure of how many bicycles actually use those on any given day. I know I used to ride in on the Galloping Goose to work for every day for five years, and I'd be lucky to see six other bicycles on, on the road. So I was just wondering if we had any count on how many bicycles actually use those lanes. To my knowledge, we have not done a, um, how would I put this? I do not know of any empirical study that has been done on um, bike lanes and the use thereof. 
having got that answer, I suggest that might be something we want to do. Um, as part of the transportation master plan, we were pushing um, alternative forms of transportation very hard. Uh, cycling is one of them, walking. We were worried about uh, mobility devices, et cetera. And the thing that worries me is everybody's putting all of this emphasis into bicycle lanes when in fact we have an aging population and I think you're gonna see a spike in bicycle use in the next five or 10 years and then a gradual decline as people get more into the mobility devices and walkers than, than bicycles. So I, I wanna make sure we're covering all of our mobility issues with, uh, rather than just bicycles. I just have to add that uh, I find it quite interesting because I'm always watching to see if it's my son who's riding his bike home. And uh, so he wears all this high-vis gear, so he's usually fairly easy to pick out. And sometimes I get tricked by the fellow who lives down the street from us, and he has a really gray beard down to about here. So I don't know if uh, we're losing uh, the seniors or gaining the seniors, but also just like to point out that bike lanes um, also help people with mobility uh, scooters uh, when they're trying to get around. Not that that's ideal. Uh, I think they're better off on the sidewalks, but if there is no sidewalk, a bike lane will do. And I guess that was my point. Are we, should we be looking more at sidewalks? Like if you, have you ever seen anybody with a scooter trying to negotiate a souk road down by uh, London Drugs, it, it's just a bloody nightmare. The new, uh, the new sidewalk in front of the Royal Bank is fabulous, but everything else is just horrifying. The letdowns are too, uh, too steep, uh, the slopes are too much, there's hydro poles in the middle of our sidewalks, uh, you know, maybe we should be spending more money to improve our sidewalks and less on bicycle lanes. It's uh, something I would like to see empirical numbers to uh, support one way or the other. Any other comments or questions? Hmm? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so uh, Jen's gonna walk us through building infrastructure um, capital plan, which is on page 64 of the financial plan. And uh, she will also uh, uh, dovetail into the equipment budget as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll start with the, the first proposed capital project is identified as a building department renovation. This would more appropriately be referred to as city hall renovation. And specifically, this is an in-progress um, project. Um, staff, we've been referring to it as phase three of the renovation works here at city hall. Um, and, and really, it's, it's improvements being made to City Hall, um, one, to address the fact that we, we are starting to outgrow um, this, this building, so we are looking at getting furniture that's taking up less space so we can put in um, more office space, and we're still um, just finalizing the, the works that are being done to our front counter reception area. Um, so the proposed funding there, uh, we had approximately $11,000 remaining from last year's budget. We are proposing to carry that forward and have recognized that additional funding will be needed to complete um, what we're referring to as phase three. And that brings us to the proposed budget of the 23500 the next proposed building infrastructure expenditure for 2018 is with respect to St. John's Church. Um, so an energy audit report was completed in 2016, um, and it is proposing um, that we look at the installation of an air source heat pump and ceiling fans with a ductless split heat pump um, for the St. John's Church, and we would be funding this um, by way of our St. John's Heritage Reserve Fund. And then looking out to 2022, I'll defer to our finance director here to speak to uh, proposed expenditure of City Hall construction. Yes, thank you. A and this uh, project, uh, Mr. Howard asked me to include for discussion at council. Now at the time that it was included, um, um, conditions were a little bit different. Now the reason it, the reasons in, it's in there is you're probably aware in our um, draft OCP recommends moving City Hall to Ocean or to Royal Bay, pardon me, um, 
the uh, staff contingent that we have at City Hall is growing and we're, we're having more trouble finding room for it, although space planning is um, uh, uh, recommended for, for 2018. Um, but also there are some opportunities around how we could fund this, uh, specifically related to Ocean Boulevard and the park and ride there, that land asset. Uh, but land use there is, uh, has changed, or, or uh, there is really no land use changes that have that have been um, pursued by council. So that funding source is, uh, isn't something that's available. So ultimately, I think uh, when I bring you um, a consolidated financial plan March 5th, this item will be removed. Um, however, uh, it, w it was in there for discussion, um, just as something that should be on, on the radar um, considering our, our OCP. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions on the building infrastructure or we'll move over to equipment. If I could just make one more comment and, and speak frankly that we don't really have a funding source for this $5.4 million expenditure at, at the current time. So it's not like we have reserves. It would have to be it would have to be debt unless um, unless we had another funding source come up. So it, again, it's in in there more for discussion than actual um, a action at this point. Thank you. Committee, or sorry, public. So as far as uh, funding the replacement of city hall, hypothetically speaking. If the city was to dispose of the Ocean Boulevard lot slash park and ride and realize about a $3.7 million windfall from doing that, could that money be put towards replacing City Hall? Uh, through the chair, uh, yeah, it could be. That would have to be a council decision, of course. So uh, speaking, well, actually, okay, I'll ask two questions. First question I have for you is just regarding the St. John's uh, Church improvement. Uh, where, where would I find how much St. John's actually costs us per year? The where, chair. Would, where would that be in core? That's going to be in the Parks Department. Uh, well, is it, and is that a specific line item? Yes. It is, okay, great. Yeah, it's called so I, I'll look that up. I'll yeah. find that. Um, and then uh, regarding the $5.4 million, um, I think it's it's basically a reality that at some point this building is failing us and uh, we will have to replace City Hall at one point. Is it not prudent for us to uh, at some point start a reserve and even if we don't find something in five years that we're at least putting money away every year towards that specific cost? Uh, through the chair, yes. Um, that would form part of a um, overall recommendation for sustainable uh, transfer to reserve for sustainable infrastructure replacement. So um, uh, on our asset management slide, we listed facilities was one of those things that doesn't have a long-term plan. Neither do we have long-term funding in for replacement of, the, of this uh, uh, building. Um, but it is an ine inevitability considering the seismic considerations of the building and just that's what happens with depreciable assets. So, uh, so as a follow-up, uh, so how do, we do how do we move that forward? How do, we, how do we begin that discussion regarding if this council would like to set up a reserve to start putting money away on a yearly basis towards uh, a new city hall? Is that something that needs to come from council that will address next year's budget? Is it something that can be discussed to be added into this year's budget? How, how is that moving forward? Uh, through the chair, it will, be uh, it will come to light when the finance department in, um, in, in, in uh, cooperation with the other departments prepare those recommendations for transfer to reserve for sustainable infrastructure. Um, I can't uh, commit that those recommendations will be 100% complete for the next year's budget, but there will be significant um, progress towards that, especially considering some of the plans that are in place for asset management. Um, so it will become clear when presented to council that we don't, we haven't funded the replacement of the of the building and what is needed to get to a sustainable level. That will become clear when uh, when those uh, recommendations are brought forward to council. Cynthia, thanks. I just would like you to sh help us find the um, St. John's Church uh, numbers 
uh, I didn't find them under parks, and uh, I just would like to see them. the chair uh it is called heritage line item in there so that refers to st john uh, grounds maintenance as well as the actual building maintenance oh pardon me uh page 49 of the financial plan <clears throat> looking at that number uh through the chair is that net or is that gross numbers so, because I know that that money, uh, that St. John's also creates revenue. To the chair, that's gross number. So the facility rental fees is listed above in the revenue section. I'm sorry, uh, could you say that again for me? Yes, to the chair, that is gross. So it's uh, the, the revenue hasn't been off, doesn't offset in the budget. It's the revenue for that facility is listed as facility rental fees uh, in the revenue section of that same budget. So that's gross. Okay, I see. I see what you're saying. So, uh, so if I can say this back to you, it, uh, Heritage Actuals in 2017, we we netted twenty two thousand five hundred, but it only cost us sixteen thousand to run it. So it's actually a cash positive through the chair for that year. Yes. Okay. Is that is that common? Is that normal? Uh, no. So, Maybe. which is oh sorry. Oh. I'll just jump in on this. So we do have a reserve fund bylaw with respect to the St. John's Heritage Reserve Fund. And so under that bylaw, what we do every year is we analyze the rental fees. And then we look at the direct costs related to that facility. So the costs related to public work staffing, so the benefit and salary costs of public work, those are funded by way of general taxation. The facility rental fees, fund the um, so utility costs of the church, so the hydro costs, et cetera. Every year we are seeing a surplus, and every year that surplus is transferred over to the St. John's Heritage Reserve Fund. May I do a follow-up? So how do I know, looking at this budget, how do I know how much net positive or deficit the St. John's is actually costing me? Like if you're telling me the public works staff are maintaining that, which is not calculated in these numbers, how do I know if St. John's is costing us $50,000 a year or $200,000 a year? And, and if, if, if you don't have the number tonight, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with you telling me later. It's just, I just, I'm trying to understand our new budgeting process, and I'm trying to understand how do I cross-reference cross those numbers. Through the chair, yeah. Uh, th that information can be made available um, pretty sure, quickly. I, I'll get yeah. it offline. Yeah. 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 Thank you. You bet. Yeah. Jason? On the same um, line, if St. John's is showing an annual net and it's going into a reserve are we using that reserve to pay for the heat pump installation yes that is what we had commented yeah thank you any other questions okay we'll move on okay so moving over to the proposed equipment expenditures um, starting with 2018 we are proposing a laminator replacement um, for $7,200. This is a new line item in the financial plan. Uh, oh, sorry. So on page 65. <laughs> so the chart here is um, all of the proposed capital expenditures for the general capital fund. Um, and, and sewer capital fund, sorry. And so first line there, the laminator replacement. So our laminator is near the end of its life um, and we are looking to replace that um, primarily to assist in communication um, and public engagement. Next line item is also a new capital expenditure proposed for this year. Um, I think we're all quite familiar with the uh, 
chairs that we sit in around this table um, and also in there and uh, the condition that some of these chairs are in. And so we are proposing to replace all of the chairs. Okay, we just have a question. Just wanted to know when you say all of the chairs, um, what about the public uh, chairs? Those are the same chairs since this hall opened, and I'm just curious if we're replacing all. Sorry, our director reminded me those are not included in this proposed. Um, I'll just put it right out there. I, I, I think those chairs should be replaced. Uh, if we want to have our public come here, they're the most uncomfortable chairs, I think, to sit in for a long meeting. So. May yeah. I just ask, is that something the council would like us to um, put into the budget for the March 5th meeting? Any thoughts? I could make that a motion if council would like. Um, I would just to to bring it forward for consideration. Uh, the replacement of the council chamber audience chairs. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you are. <laughs> Do we have a seconder? Oh, sorry. Okay, so we're bringing, um, putting forth a consideration to council for new chairs for the committee, or er, council chambers. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none opposed, so carried. And we'll Kay. continue. So moving along to the next item, um, the city's respiratory fit testing machine is near the end of its useful life and the software is no longer supported. Um, so we are proposing to purchase a new machine. The next line item, the $5,000 for the emergency storage container. This was in last year's financial, oh, sorry. Sorry, I just don't know what that is. What's a respiratory fit testing machine? Uh, through the chair, uh, this is uh, a machine that uh, we purchased approximately 15 years ago. And uh, what it does is it qualifies and does a quantitative analysis of the fit of the air seal for the SCBA masks that the firefighters use. Um, the hardware and the software are outdated and unsupported and uh, we managed to get through this year but I really don't think we're going to be able to get another year out of it. This actually, the $26,000 is a cost share between uh, 13, you'll see 13,000 of it uh, through special projects through uh, fire department and, and 13,000 through public works um, because they have piggybacked onto our system and they're now doing mask fits for all their N95 masks, all their respirators as well. Uh, and all this is driven by a statutory requirement through WorkSafe. So that's where that item comes from. And on that item, we should highlight that we do expect to recover that cost within two years. If we were to outsource, it's close to about $13,000 a year. Um, the emergency storage container, that $5,000 is proposed to outfit our storage container. Um, and we were unable to get our hands on some of the cots um, that our emergency coordinator was hoping to get. So we're hoping we can get our hands on those this year. Uh, the emergency generator, that was um, highlighted again at 2017 Q3. Um, ultimately, that generator arrived on site last month and it has been installed here at City Hall. Um, the SCADA upgrades, so this is the um, flow monitoring software that city staff use at our 10 sewer pump stations. Um, so this was a need that was identified in late 2017. The city started that replacement um, and we're continuing that for the remaining pump stations that require the replacement. The equipment number 24 replacement. So this is um, 
the city's largest trailer. This is what we use to haul excavators and backhoes around, and it, it's used um, across the organization. And so we are proposing that this is due for replacement this year in 2018. The desktop replacement program, um, this is also referred to as our evergreen program. So it's all of our computer hardware. Um, last year's financial plan established this program in our operating budget, and we are proposing um, it's more appropriately identified under our capital budget. So for 2018, um, we are looking to do some, some final replacements on some of the, the hardware that hasn't been replaced in recent years, um, and then moving forward, looking to replace everything on a uniform cycle. And then we can really benefit um, from some of the bulk purchasing as well there. Uh, we'll turn it over to our finance director to discuss the radio repeater replacement. Uh, thanks. And through the chair, I, uh, I, I asked Jenna if I could present this project because I work very closely with the Public Works Department um, uh, to, to, de to develop it. Currently, the city has a uh, radio uh, radio system for in place for its Public Works, and part of that system is a radio repeater. And being a layman, I asked, what is a radio repeater? And essentially, it, it, uh, um, it, it creates a territory for which that frequency can be used for the radios. Um, that is 20 years old, so it needs to be replaced because it's at the end of its life. Uh, part of the, uh, the 2018 project also proposes that uh, the antenna be replaced with it. Um, there are some um, remaining radios that are only analog that need to be replaced. There are a number of digital um, radios that the city is already in possession of that with the uh, replacement of this radio repeater will now be able to use the digital component of it as well. So that would be uh, phase one. Phase two for... 2019 is proposed in the amount of uh, $30,000, and that would include software upgrades to uh, uh, all of the radios that are out outfitted in uh, the city's vehicles. And some of the neat features that come along with uh, th with that upgrade would in include a GPS component, um, so it would be easy to demonstrate the, the diligence that the city has undertaken when it comes to snow plowing, for instance, or the other activities that, that are undertaken. Um, and as well, a, a, an interesting component was the the working alone considerations that are uh, being um, considered by our, our health and safety advisor at the moment. And uh, there is a, a component in that software that um, will check in on our public work staff throughout uh, the, the term of their work um, to ensure that uh, essentially what happens is it sends a signal to the radio once every hour or, or whatever determined period and the radio operator has to enter a code so it confirms that in fact they're still safe. Um, so that's just an inter interesting uh, synergy that, that occurs because we're, we're undertaking review of our work in the low procedures as it is right now. Thank you. So just over the page, the next two line items with respect to software upgrades um, and the implementation of land development software this year and next. The timing of this activity is really in part dependent on the proposed IT migration plan um, because we acknowledge that that will take a lot of our resources um, and, and will certainly affect the timing um, of when we can get to the software upgrades. Um, so we are considering um, implementing a virtual city hall web portal. This has been discussed somewhat over the last, over recent years. Um, so allowing our citizens to have access, um, you know, pay property taxes online, um, see development happening in the area, that sort of thing. Um, we're also looking at software necessary for our asset management um, processes and work order software. Um, the land development software as well um, is a large undertaking that we're, we're looking to initiate this year. Um, but again, IT migration is proposed to be the, the kind of primary focus, and, and then these initiatives will follow. Um, so on that note of the IT, moving over to the network hardware, um, this financial plan is recommending that we spend uh, just shy of $124,000 over the next five years um, on equipment that includes firewall hardware, switches, wireless routers, um, and storage area network. 
the next line item is a new capital expenditure proposed for 2019. Um, and this is training area lights for the city's fire hall. Currently, we don't have we don't have the um, area well lit, so it uh, certainly impacts the, de the department's ability to conduct training year round. And then the next three um, fleet replacement, or sorry, equipment unit replacements there, um, they're all per our fleet and equipment replacement plan. Um, unit 34, we are proposing to replace in 2019. Um, unit 75 in 2020 and Unit 50 in 2021. Any questions from committee? In the IT and software and all that sort of thing, does it include the licensing in there or is that in another part of? It would include licensing for the initial year, but that would be an additional operating cost. Correct, yeah. Yes, the, I was wondering if you'd comment further on the two items that you announced were added to this uh, at the beginning of the meeting, the Public Works 24 and the Parks 52. That's about $62,000 in capital. I was just wondering where they got moved from. Were these, I mean, they've obviously been there for a long time. Have they been moved forward from previous years or later years or? For the chair, I simply, failed to put them in the financial plan. They've always been in the financial plan in the previous versions, and uh, they've always been in the equipment replacement plan. It's just an administrative error on my part not to place them in the chart. I wanted to make sure we didn't have vehicles next year with this too. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, so, sorry, can you tell me, where, where's the emergency storage container going? Because I know we just put one at West Shore Park and Rec and we have one here, is it replacing one or is it a new one? Sorry, that um, header is slightly misleading. This is intended to fund supplies within the within container the at West Shore Parks and Rec, West, okay. um, specifically COTS. Right, thank you. And the IT network hardware, is that, is that, the, is that a shift from moving from Langford? And is, is that like servers that we're talking about or is this just internal processes that we're talking about like is this actual hardware hardware for the chair yes it's it's hardware hardware but we always had ownership of the servers which Langford maintains on our behalf so it's replacement of those servers yeah. plus any other servers around the, the city that we maintain so I'm, I'm sorry so is is the replacement of the new servers coming with internal uh, support or is that still expected that the, these monies that I'm looking are external Langford IT support so uh, like are, and, and I'm sorry just to, to clarify why I'm asking this question I'm trying to understand are we changing are we updating this software at the same time as as we transition to our own internal uh, through the chair um, some software co uh, some software c costs and upgrades will be necessary that is included in the cost of the special project of the IT migration, including the core budget of the IT. The hardware itself should represent business as usual, so IT hardware replacement was in the core budget. We've taken it out much like the, the PC replacement and, uh, and mapped out on a more reasonable basis when those, um, uh, the, the hardware is actually going to be replaced. So it's not uh, um, new hardware. It's uh, just replacement of the current hardware that we use to, to operate our IT uh, environment at the time. Sorry, one final question regarding that. Have we done any analysis on keeping it in-house versus, so the reason I ask this question is the Greater Victoria Public Library has moved all of their servers off of property and put it at UVic because they're, they're actually secure there, you know, earthquake, everything. And so it's actually safer to have it at UVic than it is for the library to maintain it themselves. Have we done any cost analysis of, of keeping it someplace secure like UVic versus uh, keeping it in-house? Uh, through the chair, um, that will certainly, um, that analysis will certainly be underway with the IT migration. So we are gonna be exploring a, a wide window of um, support options, including uh, um, uh, backup and security as well. So it's gonna form the scope of the whole IT migration um, options. 
Great. I'm just wondering about the land development software and what the benefits are to the citizens uh, of Collar of having that. Through the chair. Um, Land de land development software is is common in, in municipal government. We lack it. We lack it here. But essentially, the the service that it provides is a consolidated um, ability to track uh, land development application. So, if you have a, a DVP application, for instance, there's really a wide range of steps and inputs required in that. And right now, um, we have a, a, a disjointed filing system. In addition to that. Uh, um, it can, um, we're seeing services offered by other municipalities now where the, the publicly facing component of the land development software provides the community with up-to-date information of the status of a, of a number of those applications. Um, that's uh, a, actually a small component of the software, but it's certainly a, a benefit that is becoming a community expectation. Any other questions? Seeing none, we can carry on. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so we're now moving on to the vehicles uh, capital budget found on page 68 of the financial plan. I'm, what I'm going to do, if you, if you don't mind, Chief, I'm going to uh, save the best for last. We'll put the pumper truck at the end. <laughs> I know you've been sitting here the whole, uh, whole evening, but I appreciate that. So one thing I wanted to mention about our vehicle and our fleet capital program. Uh, an, assen an essential tenant of the program is that we are maintaining current fleet size because it's uh, um, assumed that that fleet size is providing the necessary services found within the, um, the core budget. So staff won't recommend uh, increasing the fleet size without specifically identifying it for council. So the vehicles that you have before you today uh, represent a replacement of, of an existing vehicle. That vehicle would be um, uh, retired and, and, and eliminated from the fleet. So it's, a, uh, it's just a replacement of your vehicle. So I just wanted to, to, to mention that so that council was aware that the, ex the expansion of a fleet is um, it's really a policy choice by, by council. And this budget doesn't recommend any expansion of our current fleet. Now, ve our vehicle uh, program is, uh, I'd have to say, uh, um, an example of asset management done well. The good thing about, about vehicles is that you don't have to think 50 years in the future. Um, nevertheless, our fleet manager have de has demonstrated diligence in, in the preparation of his vehicles, and uh, council has complemented that with um, adequate funding for the vehicles. So what you have before you is a recommendation of a number of vehicle uh, replacement. All, all of them should have been um, recommended in previous versions of the financial plan. All of them are funded by the fleet replacement reserves and all of those fleet replacement reserves are sustainably funding, uh, funded, except for the sewer fleet, which uh, we have a plan to fund sustainably within three years. So what I'm going to do, uh, and uh, but open for council um, questions. I'm going to mainly focus on the vehicles that are due for replacement this year. Um, and uh, if, if council wants, uh, co has any comments or questions about the vehicles in the, in the uh, subsequent years, by all means, we're available for that. What I will mention about our um, fleet replacement program, because I was probing the, the fleet manager, I said, oh, why is this vehicle you know, being replaced in seven years? And it d does make economic sense. And uh, th uh, the city had an, an E3 uh, study done, which is an equipment energy efficiency, and that study outlined recommendations for when fleet should be replaced. And it, there's a certain life at, uh, for most vehicles where the cost of maintaining that ownership uh, exceed the trade of value that you would get in that year and the reduced operating cost with the new vehicle. So all of those vehicle uh, replacement uh, years have been uh, designed with that in, ma in mind. It should be the optical, uh, uh, optimal, pardon me, optical, the optimal time in uh, the useful life of that vehicle to replace it. So this year, um, uh, staff are recommending 
um, that Public Works Vehicle 67, uh, a repair be uh, done. That would just be for the sweeper function, and that's in the amount of $5,700. Also there uh, is recommended $35,000 for sewer vehicle number 26, and this would be uh, just a repair. That's our Vactor truck. Uh, replacement of that vehicle is um, may not occur. Uh, there might be more economical uh, options for that in the, in the long term. So at the moment, uh, staff are just recommending repair to that vehicle. Parks Vehicle uh, 52 um, is recommended for replacement this year, and that's in the amount of uh, uh, $40,000. And that's just, a, um, uh, that's just your typical Parks Vehicle that's used for the, the many operations there. Some of the larger vehicles that are um, due for replacement in 2019, 2021, et cetera, You'll notice Public Works Vehicle 48 uh, is, would be the large expenditure in 2019, uh, Public Works Vehicle 53 in 2020, as well as uh, Parks Vehicle number 10, and then in uh, 2021, Sewer Vehicle 74. So those are some of the larger expenditures um, expected. Um, but as I mentioned, every year the fleet supervisor reviews the um, vehicles that are due for replacement and um, ascertains of whether that replacement is indeed needed in that year or can be deferred uh, for economical or other reasons. So with that, uh, I'll open the floor for questions. Any questions? Rob? Uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, does, does any of these vehicle purchases or repairs uh, help us with our car carbon offset goals? To the chair. None of the vehicles proposed in 2018 will. Um, I spoke exactly. I, I spoke with a fleet supervisor about that this morning, and the the recommendation is that the pool vehicles, so the city hall used vehicles, the building inspector vehicles, um, those are the ones that have been converted to the lease um, that can help us offset our carbon footprint. Right now, the um, technology isn't good for the heavy duty vehicles, the uh, pickup trucks, um, to support the. Uh, operations needed in public works. So none of those vehicles uh, at this time are recommended to be um, carbon offsetting replacement vehicles. Thank you. Just a reminder to also go to the public. I think we forgot this time. We're good. All right. Um, I just, you mentioned uh, that uh, public works vehicle 67 was for repair, but on the page it says replace so I'm just not sure if that's a typo I just thought I'd point it out if it was any other questions comments Jason um, just on the sewer vehicles uh, there's a, f a fair number of them over the four or five years here um, are those paid for by the sewer operating um, charge sewer users charge uh, through the chair Previously, they had been funded by taxes. This year, we proposed they be funded by uh, the user fee, which is why, I, at the time, I had recommended a 14% increase. That's since been reduced in the financial plan to a 5% increase. So, on an ongo uh, so the reserve has been transferred over, and uh, on an ongoing basis, it will be the plan is to be funded by the user fee. And I guess I was going to say, as a sewer user, I would appreciate to be assured that they were being used strictly for sewer maintenance and not for road maintenance. Uh, like the Vactor truck, for example, is used for cleaning out storm drains and all sorts of other things that are not sewer users. I would hate to see that charged entirely. And I see the maintenance is being charged entirely to the sewer users. Uh, so I think we have to get a handle on if the vehicles are shared, how much is actually part of the sewer and how much is actually part of public works. Uh, through the chair, the vehicles that have been identified as sewer vehicles are primarily used for sewer operations. And we uh, recognize and know that there might be some crossover with other um, other divisions and the other way around too. There are some division uh, vehicles that are used for sewer operations. But we were careful to, to ensure that the vehicles that were identified as sewer um, were large, large and partly used for sewer for, exa for exactly that reason. So I appreciate those comments. <coughs> Thanks. I have to follow up on uh, Councillor Nault, and I'm actually going to go to Public Works, if you don't mind, because I, I would like to know how much of the HVAC is actually being used outside of sewer. 
Through the chair, the HVAC is predominantly sewer. Um, storm is a sewer, uh, not funded by um, sewer users, but uh, storm system is part of the sewer well, system. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm afraid, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to, I guess I, I appreciate what you're saying, but it, it, that it's storm, storm is, storm sewers are citywide. Um, and so I, I would kind of like to understand like if if it's a small percentage, I don't care because I understand what 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 you commented about that that other vehicles would also be shared with the sewers and that. But I mean, if it's if it's fifty fifty, or if it's ninety ten, uh, that's a significant difference. So I'm trying to have a grasp of of what that number actually is. Com no, no, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Through the chair. So yeah, no, the actual numbers we can now track with our new uh, payroll system for for usage which well every day it is being tr tracked so we can easily bring those numbers to you um, and yeah and it, it, it may very well be 50 50 um, storm and drainage because a utility was is both um, drainage and and sewer so that's what it's always been used for both sorry if I just make co comment with regard specifically to the vector truck uh, you'll notice that there is no recommendation for replacement of that. So previously, all fleet was funded through taxes. So up to this point, it has been funded through taxes. Moving forward, this particular vehicle is not recommended for replacement, so it hasn't impacted the sewer user fees. So should, you shouldn't have any concern with the sewer user, sewer user fees impacting the replacement of this vehicle. However, the other sewer vehicles um, replacement would be funded by the sewer user fee. And, and we're absolutely, uh, we're happy to, um, uh, we should be a, it really a doing that analysis on an annual basis to ensure that um, the sewer u user fee isn't funding general taxation stuff and general taxation stuff isn't funding sewer user fee. That's the whole premise be behind this sewer utility is supposed to be self-financing. So um, a as Ross uh, uh, pointed out, um, we are we're looking forward to the extra information that we're going to be getting out of our payroll system now. Um, but as a matter of just diligence, that's something we should be doing on a, a regular basis as well. Anyone else? Seeing none, um, we'll continue. And uh, uh, through the chair, now the, the fire chief will discuss the, the purchase of the fire vehicle. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you see before you um, a uh, quite a large replacement purchase that's been planned for through capital asset replacement. Uh, this uh, vehicle that we're proposed to uh, replace is the first vehicle that uh, ex-retired, now retired Chief Cameron um, came to council 25 years ago and wanted to upgrade our fire fleet. Um, this was the uh, 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 first major purchase of this kind that the city did after incorporation and it's uh, now served its life. It's come come to the end of its 20, uh, 25 year life cycle. And um, unfortunately it's a little, little bit of a teary eyed because it's a beautiful truck and it still serves Colwood well. Uh, however, we're um, for a city of our size, uh, we're governed by the rules of the f set forth by the fire underwriters. Uh, if we were a city larger than us, uh, let's say Victoria or Saanich, uh, they dictate life cycle of uh, fire equipment. And uh, for a larger municipality, it would be 20 years. For where we are, uh, it's 25. So we've given it its full 20 years cycle and then pushed it back uh, to the allowed maximum of 25. Uh, now, uh, in uh, to at the end of 2019, we will receive no credit for it, and therefore that may have a ripple down effect to uh, how fire underwriters gauges our uh, property protection class, both for residential and for commercial. So there, if we uh, if we decide not to go forward and replace it, there may be there may be other ripple eff effects. Um, but uh, right now, the, uh, the it is running and has run for the last uh, about eight or nine years. It has run second due out of the station to try and increase its uh, its maintenance cycle. And uh, um, it's uh, now it's 
at the end of its life and uh, uh, hopefully with council's uh, d direction and decision we'll uh, start the process of putting out an RFP for its replacement. Uh, must be noted that it is in this year's budget um, because it uh, there is about a 12 to 14 month build time. Uh, so uh, with council's approval an RFP would go out uh, a, uh, a vendor would be selected, an award would be gone out, and then we would receive it probably uh, summer to fall of 2019, and that would put it right at the right at the 25 year for the old engine. Thank you. Uh, questions from public? Committee. Yeah. Chief, in the past, um, our sourcing has been United States, and there's been question at points um, with the exchange rate and whatever. So is this number factoring in any potential of exchange rate? And uh, through the chair, the original estimate was uh, $850,000 and that was uh, an estimate that was put forward um, uh, by the previous chief, but in consultation with where uh, industry uh, manufacturers thought the price would be for a vehicle of this kind. Um, since that original report, uh, we have increased uh, through the recommendation from the manufacturers uh, up to $900,000 to try and offset some of that. Um, hopefully we'll be in a better position uh, when the tender is awarded um, for where the Canadian dollar is, but I believe last it was at uh, 78 cents. So um, unfortunately, we have no uh, no control over that, but we're hoping that um, the uh, the information that we're, we've gotten from industry is that we're about in the right ballpark. Any other questions? Yes, um, is there any resale value to a 25-year-old fire truck? Uh, through the chair, unfortunately not. Um, I, I tried to see if uh, we could get it, uh, possibly some manufacturers would be interested in a trade-in. There wasn't a lot of, uh, yay, I'll take an old fire truck. Um, honestly, their industry is telling me that the resale value of the truck that we have that we're replacing is approximately $10,000 and we'd be lucky to get that. Uh, so it, that is unfortunate. <coughs> um, can you tell me, uh, through the chair, uh, does this fit into our sort of mutual aid agreements and like is there any, how, how does that fit within the greater region and you, we're not, I guess my question is more, we're not duplicating what everybody else has and we have a whole bunch of the same trucks sitting there. Uh, through the chair. Um, our current fleet is based on um, is based on what we we what the perceived plan and service delivery model is to our community primarily because that is our primary concern. That gives us our overall pumping capacity, the capacity to carry the adequate number of firefighters that we need. Also, what we're seeing now is um, we're seeing that we need the depth in the ability of the departments to meet the needs of the fire department or the needs of the community because we're getting double and triple header calls now. So this is two and three calls happening at the same time. Uh, in 1999, when I started with the fire department for here, uh, I turned to the chief of the day and says, oh, how many double headers do you get during the day or during the year? And he goes, oh, a couple, handful. Uh, we're doing triple headers now as a regular course of business. Uh, so, um, we're mindful of our, the needs of our community and the depth. We're also working very closely with our mutual and auto aid partners, especially uh, View Royal and now the city of Langford. Uh, we're entering in discussions with the new chief about how we can see the modeling for service delivery for the big one, the very low, freq uh, low frequency, high risk events. So that's the Walmarts are going up, the Costco's are going up, we have another Callwood Plaza fire. Uh, those uh, type of high hazard, or high hazard, low frequency, uh, really stretch any one fire department's resources. So, um, we're mindful of what we need to bring to the table for our mutual aid partners, and also we're in discussions with them and saying what are they bringing the ta to the table for us. So it's quite detailed, but yes, we are we we are making sure that we're not duplicating, but we're complementing in a region wide planning. Any other questions? No, thank you, Chief. Uh, just realizing that it's been two and a half hours, I'm just wondering if it's committee's wishes to take a five minute break or if you'd like to get through the last bit. How will our, our uh, <coughs> what does staff think? How much longer do we have? Yeah, 
uh, through the chair. Ten minutes. I can hang in ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll continue then with parks infrastructure. Yes, so on that note, um, we're on page 70 now of the financial plan document. So just reviewing the proposed parks infrastructure expenditures. Um, with respect to Colwood Creek Park, uh, we are looking at replacing the service panel, the lighting service panel there this year um, at an estimated cost of $12,000. Also at Col Colwood Creek Park, um, last year's financial plan did propose that we look at funding the installation of a parking lot uh, for 2018, and so that has remained in the financial plan. We are also um, proposing the replacement of a stairway within Latoria Creek Park. Um, the stairway is aging, and um, rather than wait on the Parks and Trails Master Plan that was discussed earlier, uh, we are proposing to, to fund this work in 2018. Park signage, um, this has been a line item in our capital budget um, for a few years now, so we're continuing with the installation of signage throughout the city. Um, just earlier this week, I saw some on social media, so that, that is in progress and, and well underway. Looking out to 2020, both at Colwood Creek Park and at Herm Williams Park, the city is proposing uh, the installation of washroom facilities. Um, so at Herm Williams Park, a uh, more aesthetically pleasing washroom. Um, and then same with uh, Colwood Creek Park um, washroom facilities to replace the, the portable that's currently there. Uh, both of those were identified in, in last year's financial plan for 2020 as well. And, and that's it on the proposed parks infrastructure expenditures. Happy to answer any questions. Go to the public first. Any questions? Yeah, committee? Bob? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, we, we're not anticipating spending any money at Royal Bay uh, in, in the parks over the next five years. Through the chair, um, we do have the Meadow Park electrical upgrades that um, are at Royal Bay. Um, and I would think that um, should the parks master plan um, project or program be adopted, then that would put forth what our priorities would likely be for all of our parks, including Royal Bay. Uh, so, Suri, so as a follow-up then, again, I'm trying to learn this new budget. So you, you just mentioned that we've got $14,000 worth of lighting that's going in at Royal Bay. Is that what? Is, sorry, did I mishear what you said? Sorry, I thought you said something about Royal Bay that we were putting some infrastructure in there. Uh, n not fourteen thousand dollars. No. What, what was um, it? So, if you go back to, um, could perhaps the director of finance come up with the page, the appropriate page number? Page forty-five, and uh, we went over it earlier. It's ninety-six hundred dollars. So for electrical. So sorry, why I'm I'm trying to understand why it's in certain categories. So why is it not in this category? Through the chair, uh, we have thresholds for capital expenditures, and sorry. we have thresholds, accounting thresholds for. Oh, I see. Yeah, so so it was under ten or something. Uh, is that the it, idea? it could, it could very well be under park infrastructure as well, but um, there's a little bit of a judgment, a professional judgment used, and, and in this case, the threshold. It, it, again, it, it, and I, I want to be clear, it's not a criticism. I'm just trying to understand why things are one place and not in another place. So, Any other questions? Cynthia? Thanks. For some time now, uh, and I just bring it up because of the call, um, sorry, saying the wrong thing, the sign, uh, park signage, there we go. Um, I was recently uh, walking through, I um, can't remember the name of it, Royal Bay Park uh, in the centre, and one of the issues is that recommended years ago uh, that we need to have some interpretive signage in our parks because people don't recognise the importance. So I, I guess some kids have scrambled up to the top of the cliffs where there there is fencing. It's pretty obvious you're not supposed to go in there. They've dislodged all of the moss uh, from off the top of the mossy rocks and done 
significant years worth of damage. So um, it was something that has been considered before at parks and I just wanted to flag it since it was in the budget. Uh, just if people understood the damage that is done, I think less damage would, would happen. And so some interpretive signage would um, be beneficial and I don't know if that's contemplated under that item. Sorry, the question on the Meadow Park uh, electrical upgrades uh, brought me back to that page, uh, page 44. On page 44, it's uh, $6,900. On page 45, it's $9,600. Uh, which one is correct? To the chair, sixteen nine hundred. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Sorry, I just did, uh, I guess I didn't do a very good job of asking my question. So I was asking, is interpretive signage included in the park signage? Uh, through the chair, uh, this. Um, project is uh, spearheaded by the communications manager, so I don't have that detail at hand. Um, I know that um, staff were in discussions with Royal Bay specifically with regard to interpretive signage, um, but the developer has since um, switched, so um, we were not able to get the interpretive signage we were hoping for um, throughout the Meadow Park. Um, there may be opportunities in the future th for that, but um, we were not successful uh, with regard to that last year. Um, I can definitely ask um, the manager of communications uh, with regard to interpretive signage being included for parks. Um, I can comment a little bit on that. I know the communications has been working somewhat in conjunction with ELSI on interpretive signage for the Lagoon uh, Bird Sanctuary. So yes, uh, there are plans for signs in this year's budget for supposedly we're seeing design soon, but I guess uh, that'll wait till the next LC meeting. Thanks, I'll, I'll try to bring that up when, when she's back and if she's away then. Okay, any other questions, comments? No, we'll continue. through the chair. Uh, so now we are moving on to our final capital budget. And uh, after uh, consideration of this capital budget, just want to do a quick wrap up with council. There's a number of items um, through discussion and uh, uh, that, that council has asked to uh, um, reconsider at the next budget. So I'll, I'll go over some of those items as well. So the one capital item listed in the sewer utility infrastructure um, capital budget on page 72 of the financial plan is the Ocean Boulevard pump station, uh, moving that pump station. So currently that pump station is located at the southern end of the, the Coburg uh, Peninsula and it's uh, impacted by seawater during storm events. I don't want to mistake the history with this because I'm, I'm not completely familiar with it. Um, so I know the, the Director of Engineering will be able to help me out in, in many regards. But I believe that um, the um, possibility of moving that pump station has been before council in, in the past and uh, what I believe council is waiting for is a study that out outlines the different options with regard to moving that what the costs are um, so council's not in receipt of that um, so the 25 the 2.5 million dollars is a uh, an, an estimate at this point um, but when that becomes available the various options will be explored do you have anything you want to add to that Nikki thank you Thank you, through the chair. Um, it was at the March 29th, 2016 council meeting, so it definitely predated me as well, um, that council approved um, that 
uh, there would be some flexibility to either in 2016 complete phase one of some pump station protection, which was contained in a previous report, um, or build a replacement pump station. Um, so the estimated cost to relocate the pump station was included in the five-year plan. Um, KWL is our consultant with regard to um, the uh, relocation. Um, they have been hired to look at possible locations, uh, possible locations to relocate the pump station. They have come up with three possible locations. The findings with regard to that report will be presented at a public meeting by the consultant, and that will be this year. And of course, the public will be invited to provide input. Um, part of the scope of their work was to complete a conceptual design of the chosen location and provide a plan for a managed retreat of the sewer system as the sea level rises. And the conceptual design will allow for a more accurate cost to be estimated to relocate the pump station and apply for grants if available. So that report will be before council. The um, number that is um, in the five-year plan has been uh, vetted through the report, but of course it will have to be further refined um, should council choose to go ahead with that. Thank you. Just um, asking public, any questions? No, nope. committee, Jason? Just to refresh council's memory, um, the original protection of the existing pump station was presented as a three-phase plan. Uh, they carried out phase one, which was the most basic when committee and council looked at costs of phase two and three, it covered a pretty significant chunk of the cost of the actual replacement. And it would not protect the pump station uh, in a severe overtopping. The public works would still not be able to access it unless they had a Zodiac. So um, at that point, council decided to investigate more thoroughly the replacement rather than the reinforcement. And I think that is a sane decision, and I'm eagerly awaiting to see what the report is. Uh, thank you. I actually, I do not have any questions about this, but I, I do have one more question about parks. So uh, once everybody's done asking us, if I, we could go back to just uh, one final question, please. Any other questions? Cynthia? Thank you. Um, just under the sewer utility, it mentions the um, funding source, including our reserves, our surplus, and deferred revenue. Uh, but this is sewer infrastructure. And so I'm just wondering um, if uh, every taxpayer in Colwood is expected to contribute to the, the, the sewer infrastructure in this case. Through the chair, good question. Even if we wanted to fund this through the sewer utility, we simply don't have the reserves this in the sewer utility. So this would be mostly funded uh, through gas tax and other, and other means, which is uh, uh, representative of the whole tax base. Anyone else for sewer? Jason? Yes, on a philosophical note to that, all of the development that is happening in Colwood is a result of the sewers. So you could very easily argue that the sewers are a general benefit to the city, as are the schools, which I don't use because my kids don't go to school anymore, the hospitals, which I don't use because I don't get sick, <laughs> 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 and the fire department, which I've never had any need for wow. yet. W with, <laughs> with the <laughs> However, one of my builders had uh, need for the fire department. We'll discuss that at another time. <laughs> Any other questions? Rob, you can. Thank you. Um, so it just occurred to me, so I, I, I would just like to bring it up for a quick discussion I in regards to, and I understand, I don't think it's actually officially called a park uh, right now, but it's the lands by uh, Ocean Grove with the apple trees and uh, yeah, and I understand that it's green space, but do we not have, um, we have no plans to ever invest into that property? I mean, we, we have a building there that's theoretically ours, and I mean, we, you know, I'm not sure when we're going to get it, but, um, or if we have it, 
that's a fascinating question to find that out. But I'm just curious, what is our plans with that um, and over the next five years since there's nothing in our plans around that? So through the chair, um, that park has a name. It is called Pit House Park. It's called Pit House Park, I believe. Um, I do not know for certain what the plan is for the former, um, actually, sorry, the former sales center for, for Ocean Grove. We do own the building. That building is ours. Um, but I do not know what our current long-term plan is for that. Therefore, it's not in, in this iteration of the five-year plan. So to follow up on that, uh, where, where in this budget would I see the maintenance of that building? Uh, like from a dollar standpoint? Like wh who's wh where where is that and ha and how do we define that and which leads into the whole concept of maintenance around the building you know cutting the lawns and 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 I guess I I'm also trying to understand normally this would come to a parks committee meeting but we don't have parks anymore so I'm trying to understand what our long term vision is with that as well if if it was meant to be cut if it's meant to be I know I know there was emails going around around we didn't realize that we needed to do some maintenance around the apple trees but I guess I'm trying to understand that the what is our long-term vision with that park or green space through the chair um, so long-term vision uh, would be encapsulated in the 2019 proposed project for the parks master plan Sorry, insofar as where um, the money is to maintain it, that would be through an operating budget, not a capital budget. And I would really like to see this brought to committee as a whole with recommendations on use of that building. It's, it's a valuable asset that is being totally wasted, and I've been trying for three years to get the staff and the mayor moving on what can we do with this building. And part of the problem was it wasn't entirely clear that it was Callwoods. N now it is entirely clear that it is Callwoods. And I think it's a fantastic asset. We could have a, well, pick something, coffee shop. Uh, we could move Coast Collective down there. We could have a neighborhood pub and make Gordy happy. <laughs> uh, any number of things. And it would be a fabulous place to have a coffee while you're wa walking your dog, for example but right now it's sitting empty. Um, and as far as maintenance goes, Elsie has been cooperating with Public Works to do invasive species removal through the park. Uh, they're trying to come up with a more comprehensive plan for that right now, and uh, I'm eagerly awaiting that from Elsie and Public Works. Sorry, I just wanted to add, I don't have the specific details, but just this morning at our management meeting, um, comments were made with respect to the former um, sales center that the city does own um, with proposed ideas for what um, may be happening with that center, and, and that information will be coming forward to council. Um, a comment was made with respect in the next month or so. Through the chair, that was exactly what I was um, dueling with <laughs> with the uh, buttons for. It, it, it definitely is um, top of mind, um, but insofar as putting together um, a project for the capital plan, it, it, we just qu aren't quite there yet. And just a reminder to council, that's a property that's recently changed hands of for ownership, and I know they've been working with staff on coming up with a new plan for the property down there and, and of which there has been discussion on that park and location as well. So it could be all folding together. Uh, last I heard would be late March, maybe April, that they would uh, have something ready. Thanks. I, I would just uh, remind staff to look back for old reports because I recall a report coming forward that was quite detailed about some limitations 
on the, on the sales center, and uh, I'm sure that it, it probably needs to be updated uh, with the more recent information. But uh, uh, I can't recall all the details, but I know there were some complications. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Okay, Cynthia. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot my uh, one from earlier, which was after we talked about um, the funding source, uh, it made me realize that um, in one of our budgets that we were looking at, I had seen a listing of our reserves and their balances, and I just wondered if staff would remind me again where I find those. Uh, thank you. Uh, through the chariot, there is a listing in the financial plan page 57. That'll include um, our uh, statutory reserves, the reserves that have been established by bylaw um, by council, as well as deferred revenue reserves, such as gas tax, and also general and sewer surplus as well. Page 57. Any other questions or comments? So just before we end, I'll give the public, aka Chris, final opportunity to speak. Is that his name? Actually, in a way, that's an excellent segue to my uh, final questions, and they're going to be kind of questions rather than a comment. Um, having taken a look at the number of people who voted last year in, at the last election in Colwood, I was quite disappointed and I was kind of motivated to look at that because I believe one of the councillors, if I remember correctly, it was Councillor Nault, stated that more people took the time to comment on the official community plan than actually voted. And that was a good message for me to hear. Um, as many people have noticed, I take an interest in the municipal affairs of the city that I live in. And I would very much like to see the city promote getting out and voting. I think it's really sad that we have to do that. I noticed in the uh, corporate administration section of the budget on page 21, at the top of the page, there's a bullet that says manage the 2018 general lo local election process. I, I recall there being a contract let to the previous facilitator of the election, and perhaps someone could point me uh, as to who I should be speaking to uh, to find out what the city can do to increase communications to get people interested in voting and finding out information about candidates. I respect that, in a way, it's the responsibility of people running for office to generate interest, um, but I'd like to see the current voter apathy come to an end, and I'm not really sure what the right venue to do that is, whether that's a separate budget item that this committee would consider looking at, um, to just have some communications. Hey, the election's coming up in two months. Get out, get to know the people. Um, and also along that line, um, because there's this contract, are there opportunities for people who are interested in volunteering, whether that's you know scrutineering things or guiding people to City Hall for where the election might be occurring or just generally trying to get the word out that it's important to get out and vote because a lot of people in our country have paid a huge price for the rights that we have in a democratic society. And I, for one, am not going to let those uh, go without a huge fight. And I will do everything I can to try and promote people getting out and voting. So I don't, I don't really have um, a suggestion for how to bring that to fruition, um, but it's something that's near and dear to my heart. So if anybody does have comments, I'd be happy to receive them either this evening or most of you have my email address. Um, or if you could point me to a member of city staff who's already coordinating that sort of thing, I'd greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I'll, I'll just comment that the um, um, best person to talk to is Pat Van Buskirk. And uh, the election budget that establishes, it is uh, contracted for the chief election officer that council is appointed and, and the deputy. Uh, but also uh, there's an allowance for supplies, for advertising, for a number of different things. So um, 
uh, Ms. Van Buskirk, as well as the Chief Election Officer, can be creative how they go about uh, engagement this year. So I, I would recommend that you touch base with her and share your ideas and um, also probe her for what her ideas are for this coming election. May I follow up with a supplementary, please? Um, you wouldn't happen to know the approximate dollar value of how much is used for communications, would you? Uh, through the chair. Why don't I get that to you once the meeting is over? I can access it fairly quickly. Thank you. Yeah. Carol? Uh, something that w Sandra had done last election run was once all of the candidates were declared in, in the running, um, she coordinated sort of an open house mixer here at City Hall that allowed any interested members of the, the public to just come in and it wasn't, it wasn't a, a, a Q and A or, or anything formal like that. It was more about meet and greet and you know ask your own personal questions versus the forum that sometimes comes through the chamber uh, where, where they have you know, a, a public session that way. So um, I think that it was generally felt by the folks attending and, and the folks that were involved in, in the process uh, to be very valuable and, and quite connecting to, to it. And I do believe that she has something like that in mind <laughs> for when the time comes, but uh, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen or, you know, until all the declarations and everything are in place. Thanks. I just wanted to comment that um, I think it was 2003 that I started going to um, AVICC and and uh, I've always attended the UBCM convention meetings and quite often uh, voter turnout is, is a really big issue. Um, so it's certainly not unique to Colwood. Um, and, and it varies. Uh, in municipalities, um, some are low, some are moderate, some are really high. It tends to be uh, the communities where um, people feel, feel most invested uh, or and perhaps most at risk uh, that that they're fiercely participatory. Uh, Machosen and Highlands, for example, in the CRD have very high turnouts at their council meetings and at their elections. Uh, I'm not sure that everybody loves budget meetings. Um, I find them highly illuminating, but uh, that's just me. I, I like to know what's actually happening. Um, but one of the comments that I thought was uh, very interesting uh, that I heard um, I was in an auditorium, I can't remember which convention, and uh, the question was asked, um, what made you first run for council? And of all the, we had little clickers, we're doing electronic responses, and one of the number one answers, what prompted people to run for council, was that they felt that someone truly um, with bad intent uh, was potentially going to run successfully for council. And so quite often that, that has been the impetus to push people to, to be involved. And I thought that was um, quite curious. And uh, um, a lot of people uh, spoke passionately like yourself about democracy and the importance of, of keeping it out there. So, um, and what I've heard from people that I've talked to after the election who were willing to admit, and lots of people don't admit if they didn't vote, uh, from people who didn't vote was that they felt that they didn't know enough. They were very intimidated by this process. Um, and I think everybody who, of us who participated in the meet and greet uh, that the city of Colwood did felt that it did a lot to break down those barriers and give people the opportunity to just talk. So I, I think it's all about laying out the breadcrumbs, to be quite honest. And um, I've certainly tried. I have um, i don't know how many people remember, but I was chair of Parks and Rec for a long time, and I tried to make our meetings friendly. So I used to bake cookies and bring them, and even that didn't work. <laughs> 
I still had uh, two or three diehards. So people have busy lives, uh, but, but I think there's a lot we can do to make people feel that they have the information they need to be involved, and that's probably the most important, and talking it up uh, to your friends and neighbours is probably um, the best thing I can think of to get people involved. Any other final comments or questions from community? Seeing none, we'll go to staff. <laughs> Sorry, I'll be very brief. I just wanted to wrap up with a couple things that you'll be looking for next week. I'll be two minutes. Um, one thing is the West Shore Detachment building uh, improvement costs, which has been in the budget historically. Lakeford f uh, today gave me the budget for it, funded fully by reserve. That'll show up, uh, so that'd be something new. I'll be removing the city hall renovation. Uh, I heard from council that they wanted to see the West Shore Parks and Rec surplus. They want to see a transfer to reserve there. That'll show up. Costing for civilian audience chairs. Um, space planning, which was a special project that's been added but hasn't been discussed. And correct the middle, middle park type on any other titles we have. So those things will, will come forward in addition to the overall picture next uh, next week. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, one more. <laughs> just, just I wanted to just say that with regard to the police building, uh, that traditionally has been something that um, has some skepticism attached to it. So I would really be like to see uh, a full vetting of, of what's being charged out. Okay, so I don't see any other comments, so I guess just the final comment, thank you to all of staff for doing such a great job on the budget, and um, I know it's not easy, and you know, we've all sat here, and you've certainly made it easy to read with the layout, so thank you for that. So with that, um, we come to the next meeting, uh, 7.1. The next committee of the whole meeting is scheduled for Monday, March 5th, and will be at 6 p.m. or the call of the chair. So, adjournment. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. <laughs> 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 All those in favor? Yeah. Opposed? Yeah. None?